require advanced degrees or low paying jobs that offer little opportunity for growth. That leaves a gap in good paying accessible jobs, ones that have relatively low barriers to entry, but a clear path to the middle class. These are the ones we want and we need to make an extra effort to create. So we created a plan by investing in sectors that meet two criteria. They have a high potential for future growth and they offer a lot of jobs that pay at least $50,000 a year, including many that don't require advanced degrees. Our plan focuses on technology, life sciences and healthcare, industrial and manufacturing, and the creative and cultural sectors. While the city's investments will directly account for 100,000 jobs, we expect these high growth industries to create far more over the next decade and beyond. These are the job creators of our future. A great example of a future job creator is cybersecurity. As the threat of online cyber attacks increases, the cybersecurity field continues to grow rapidly. Postings for these jobs are up 74%, and the industry is expected to bring in more than $100 billion by 2020. These jobs pay good wages and offer real career ladders for people with varying levels of education. Now New York is incredibly well positioned to become the next home for cybersecurity. Quite frankly, we should be the leader in the field. We have the world's largest financial institutions, the biggest buyers of cybersecurity services outside of the federal government. So we are partnering with both industry and academic leaders to build a first of its kind hub for cyber innovation here in the city. We released a request for proposals to create a set of programs to strengthen the city's cybersecurity industry and are seeking responses from academic and industry partners with, with proposals due by February 16th. We are also making historic investments in the life sciences. As part of this initiative, the city will invest $500 million in life sciences and R&D over the next 10 years. Of this $500 million, $100 million will be used to create a new applied life sciences campus, which will drive bioengineering innovation, R&D, and entrepreneurial training. Another $50 million will be invested in expanding New York's R&D facilities. Even though we have invested a strong life sciences network today, technology and R&D needs are constantly evolving. We want to make sure our spaces are the best equipped in the country. Our efforts in doing this are aided by the Industrial Development Agency, a public benefit corporation under state law in the 1970s, created under state law in the 1970s. IDA is responsible for encouraging economic development throughout the five boroughs, preserving existing jobs, and creating and attracting quality, well-paying ones. While the IDA is administered by EDC employees, it has a separate legal existence and an independent board. In 2016, for the first time ever, EDC's New Market, or Neighborhood Capital Corporation was selected as a recipient for the New Markets Tax Credits Program with a $55 million allocation. New Markets is a federal program designed to generate private sector capital invest that is invested in low-income communities. Since the announcement of this award, we have deployed, deployed $48 million of those credits for affordable housing, community space, and food retail in four low-income communities, including the Rockaways, Central Harlem, and Soundview. In an effort to preserve low-cost industrial space in the city, we recently awarded Greenpoint Manufacturing and Design Center with a $17 million allocation for industrial, uh, its industrial job center in Ozone Park, Queens. While the how and what we do are extremely important, we are also laser focused on who that, who, yes, okay, who it is that benefits from our programs. This is why we have invested considerable resources into our MWBE capacity building and local hiring programs. In FY17, we awarded $118 million to MWBEs. Since fiscal year 15, we have awarded over $269 million. We have been able to accomplish this by inserting ambitious MWBE goals on applicable project, projects at a rate of 35%. Our Construct NYC initiative is also a crucial component in our success. Construct NYC is a pre-qualification program that allows MWBE firms to compete against each other for similarly sized contracts. To date, we have awarded over $10 million in contracts to qualified firms. We are incredibly proud of the work uh, we have done to make New York a fairer city today and a stronger city tomorrow. We look forward to continuing our dynamic work with the council as our partner. Thank you for your time today. I'm happy to take questions.
Thank you, thank you. We've been joined by a bunch of our council members. So we have Keith Powers, Council Member Mark Levine, Council Member Peter Koo, Council Member Carlos Menchaca, Council Member Inez Barron, Council Member Adrian Adams, Council Member Brad Lander, and Council Member Carlino Rivera to share that. Where's so Carlos? many of the things we just talked about were things that probably merit their own hearings and that's what today's focus is as we join for the first time as a as a committee on EDC we started off with a statement that I want to make sure that was re-echoed from my friends and council members that this is your committee these are your communities if there are questions and further topics that we want to address this is the forum that we're going to do it together uh, I thought this was a good way to start off since we're all kind of learning together uh, the many wonderful projects that are going on through EDC but then we come from communities and neighborhoods that want to make sure that the vision includes their voices and going forward. So um, I think kind of just starting off, I think some of the council members uh, get to know we were at the board hearing this morning, and I think we were one of the first to do that. And I encourage you to come, they meet quarterly, and you can see the, the machinations and the, the, the details of the meetings that are put forward and how they develop the policy. Just today they were talking about um, the status of the Amazon bid. So, President Patrick, do you have an update for us? on Because that was some exciting news that you're talking today about the Amazon current bid. Oh, you want an update about Amazon? Sure, <laughs> absolutely. So, um, so I think, you know, we're, so the, the, the great news about Amazon is that they've decided to move forward with uh, New York City on the short list of cities that they're proceeding to evaluate for their second headquarters. So Amazon, uh, is looking to have a second headquarters located in an additional city. They currently have a, one headquarters in Seattle, and they're looking to hire up to 50,000 people in a second city. So we think this is a great opportunity for New York um, because fundamentally Amazon's interest is in talent. That's why they're expanding beyond their Seattle uh, footprint. And we think New York City has a, you know, a lot to offer on the talent front. We, you know, we have an incredible number of talented New Yorkers. We have the most diverse you know, population, um, with your borough being the most diverse. Um, and you know, we, offer, we, we believe we have a great argument for Amazon and why they should come here. And we think it's a great opportunity for New York City just because any time anyone wants to come in and hire 50,000 New Yorkers with good jobs, it's something we have to jump at. So what would be the next step? So the next step is Amazon has announced that this short list of sites. Um, we know that they're going to be um, asking for additional data about um, each city. So we have an extensive data request from them targeted around you know what rents could be and all of this. And all, most of the um, most of the properties are private properties, so they're owned by private developers. So we're coordinating with them to get all of that data information back to Amazon. You know, Amazon is well known to be a data-focused company, so I think they're going to be running some complicated computer modeling um, to make their decision. It's right up your alley. What's that? It's right up your alley. Exactly. To get them all that data. Well, we'd be excited to, to yeah. be part of that. If there's any program or plan that we yeah. can participate in, especially with um, the possible areas within New York City where yeah. the jobs could be created. Right. Well, I think one of the things that's most the, the most exciting potentials for opportunity is to create partnerships for workforce development um, with CUNY and other academic institutions um, in the city. If Amazon decides to come here, um, you know, we want to make sure that they're getting the most diverse talent possible. So again, connections with everything from high schools on up through um, college and even graduate schools to make sure that we have as many New Yorkers from as many backgrounds as possible getting into those jobs. So we're going to both, or we're going to demonstrate them that we have the, demonstrate to Amazon that we have the ability to do that. And then if they decide to come here, we're going to make sure they get the most possible, the most diverse possible pipeline of talent. I think that gives us a great opportunity to work with our next generation, our students too, yeah. because they're very familiar, they follow the company. Um, these are our next, our next success stories or our students. Yeah. And we talked about in one of our meetings about expanding EDC's role into our high schools and middle schools and to give our students a direct bridge as to the economic opportunities right here in the city. Um, I think one of those that you said today at the hearing was the life sciences, I think it's a $300 million initiative that's being, that just was launched. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe we could talk a little bit about the current status of that and has a site been determined on that yet? 
No, so, so overall it's a, it's a $500 million initiative into the life sciences, which is targeted towards creating 15,000 jobs in the life sciences. Um, over uh, 10 years? Um, over 10 years, okay. yeah. So one of the, um, the centerpieces of that plan is, the hub, is a new hub. Um, you know, we like to think about it as the Cornell Technion for the life sciences, um, which is a center of R&D and research that sp spins out a lot of new, um, you know, new companies. Uh, what we have at the current moment, we released a request for expressions of interest that focused on three city sites. Um, one is in East Harlem, um, the other one is in um, the Flatiron area, east side of Manhattan. Um, the third area is in Long Island City um, on the waterfront. So how are those sites chosen? Those, sites, those sites were chosen um, as being, you know, large scale um, publicly owned sites that could potentially accommodate the level of use that we're looking for, but also that are in close proximity to the major uh, academic and research institutions that run up and down the east side of Manhattan. So New York's strongest case for life sciences, they always have amazing research universities, you know, all the way, you know, we have NYU Langone, which is um, in the 20s on the east side of Manhattan, all the way up to Mount Sinai um, in the high 90s and low 100s in Manhattan. And so creating this research hub in close proximity to, to those research institutions um, is what uh, I think is the most compelling argument for having a hub here in the city. So one of the factors would be the proximity to the education. Yes. So is there a, a list of sites that the EDC has already prepared within each borough for those type of initiatives, or do we conduct independent uh, surveys on each one? Uh, right. So for, I, I think you know we 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 have we did a um, as part of the um, initial housing plan at the outset of this administration. The EDC worked with the mayor's office to conduct a vacant land survey in the city which is broadly defined as really underutilized land, so land where there's a potential for development. Um, you know, th these three sites, each one has their own story um, that was chosen for this project. Um, you know, one is a large DOE facility that's currently in operation. That's the one in Long Island City. Um, the second is uh, in East Harlem. It's a, it's a well-known site that has been of interest um, to uh, the previous speaker, uh, Melissa Marcovarito, for some time. Um, and the third um, is, is, is lower downtown is actually the, is the current home to the public health lab, which is being relocated to Harlem, um, which was just announced earlier this year. So that opened up that site as a potential for development. Okay, so you mentioned the vacant land survey. Yes. How often is that conducted? Is that something on a so that, so basis? So we conducted that at the beginning of the administration, and we, and we regularly reevaluated to look at what sites are available for development. Um, I think the truth of the matter is that these days most of the sites for potential development are like the ones that I talked about, which is they have a current use on them right now and we need to identify a relocation option. So for the public health lab um, site, that currently, that's currently located there. We're going to need to build out a new public health lab in Harlem in order to make the site available. But broadly speaking, we look regularly at the whole portfolio of city assets and see what the, the, you know, what the greatest potential is for development. And another great resource for identifying properties is talking to local council members about you know, what are the properties in their neighborhoods um, that are publicly owned that they would like to see redeveloped. Um, you know, that's what's led to some of our most successful projects. I think that would be something we'd all like to, I think, expand a little bit. I think we'd be excited to know um, current spaces and lots that are being looked at and mm -hmm. others that are not. So maybe we can get back to us on the council members that you have sites that you've already located and the possibility yeah. of new sites. Oh, I think absolutely. That I would be a great part of the transparency and that's where the community boards and the civic groups yeah. and the council members can say, we've, we've been addressed with EDC. There are some sites within our community that have possibilities and let's plan in the future for oh, yeah. Well, the next generation. Absolutely, and I just want to be clear. There, we wouldn't proceed on any of these projects without a significant, addition, a significant outreach to the community before we proceeded with anything. So, I mean, um, I think any of them certainly require a full Euler process at the, at, for disposition, but apart from that, well before that, we'd want to talk to the community about what they were focused on and what they wanted to see at the site. So with those three sites for the life sciences, how, when is the decision made there? So there's so we so first of all I should say um, that those are those are three sites 
that are potentials, and then there's also the possibility that it could be a private site as well. So we've just put those sites on the table from the city. Um, and in addition to that, we've said to the private market, if you have a site that's compelling that, that you own, that you want to put on the table, we could also consider that. So it doesn't have to be one of those three sites. Um, the way this would work is we have, we're, right now we're just asking for, as I said, expressions of interest. Um, we would follow that up based on those responses with a second RFP, a request for proposals um, based on what we hear. So at that point, um, it's conceivable that people will demonstrate interest in some of the sites and not others, so we'll have more information then. And we do a second round um, of proposals to get a cl clarity around what people are interested in. Um, and then we would obviously, as a part of that, be in extensive discussions with the community to understand you know, what might be possible. So the timeline that you envision. Oh, for the, for the <laughs> Longer than, <laughs> I, full time longer, like. longer than I'd like it to be um, for the hub, unfortunately. I mean, I think, you know, like just to, to, to the hub, public health lab as an example, it's going to take us years to, um, we have to build a new public health lab in Harlem before um, we could even consider locating uh, an, uh, a, a project on the site in lower Manhattan. And so, uh, so I think, it, you know, give, it, given that, um, you know, we wouldn't be able to begin construction um, in Lower Manhattan until, you know, at least 2020 at the earliest. Um, so that would mean, I think our goal is to, um, you know, try to select a winner for the hub by sometime next year, so sometime in 2019. So it was, it's, it's certainly more than a year away before we'd select someone, and then we would obviously go through um, any approval process. That, that, those are the exciting parts that we all want to partner in. And I, yeah. So you, you outlined in your testimony that you create a plan by investing in sectors that meet two criteria, that they mm -hmm. have potential for future growth and they offer jobs of at least 50,000. Yes. Um, and I think you said there's over 500 current EDC projects? Yes. So now how, do, how does, and if you have that information, how does that break down over the city? Do you have how those projects break down per borough? Um, I think that's one of the I don't, questions. You know, I don't have in front of me the by borough list of the number of projects per borough, but certainly we have major projects in every borough. Um, uh, <clears throat> I mean, I think it, you know, it, it, it really varies, but I'm, I spend a lot of time um, in Staten Island and the Bronx, you know, Queens and Brooklyn, and uh, these days, um, you know, slightly less time in um, Lower Manhattan. Um, we've been spending more time in Upper Manhattan recently. Um, but you know, we we are focused on the whole city. We want to see, as you know, as sort of evidenced by the name of the hearing, all five boroughs have as many economic development opportunities as possible. We figure we start off with the world and narrow it down. From yes, there. exactly. Like all the boroughs at once. Exactly. Uh, well, I mean, I think the process itself, and I think we saw that this morning at the at the board meeting. Mm -hmm. So once developing the next project. Yeah. So take us through how a, another project in one of the five boroughs would be determined to get green-lighted and move forward. Sure. Um, so I think you know, maybe the, the best example I'll give you is the effort in downtown Far Rockaway um, that we just... <laughs> That's NYCHA. They yeah, have yeah, a whole no, set no, of on the other side. Oh. <laughs> Speak of the devil. <laughs> um, wow. <laughs> I, I was literally about to. Did you guys plan that? Because he yeah. just said, talking about the Rockaways, and then walks in. So we've been uh, joined by Councilmember wow. Richards. <laughs> That's amazing. Um, so as I, was, as, as, as I was about to say, as an example of how, um, you know, how we select our projects, you know, the downtown Far Rockaway project, I think, is a great example of that. Um, you know, we worked very closely with a stakeholder committee um, in downtown Far Rockaway. Um, we knew that there were a lot of publicly owned um, uh, assets in downtown Far Rockaway, but you know the council member had you know had come to, to come to the city and said that there's a huge potential to revitalize downtown Far Rockaway. How can we work together to make that possible? And then you know he helped us work with the community to identify what the what the focus points of any effort would be, um, and we did an extensive you know, over a year long process to, you know, identify what was possible. We made commitments to investment along the way, and ultimately we took it through a public approval process in partnership with, with uh, Council Member Richards. So I think that, you know, it's a great example of, of how, you know, we start with a, a lot of times it's an idea that comes from the, from the council or from local stakeholders saying, we want to see a change in our community. 
you know, what's possible here. Um, and so that gets brought to us and we say, well, let's work on a plan. And we, you know, we try to help set people, set the parameters of what's possible and what isn't. Um, and ultimately, I think the outcome in downtown Fort Rockway is going to be exceptional. Um, you know, a lot more open space, you know, new, um, you know, improved facilities for educational facilities, um, a significant number of units of housing, um, and, you know, revitalizing the downtown area and getting rid of some really blighted areas that have been, uh, you know, giving downtown Fort Rockway a bad name for too long. Congratulations, Councilmember Richards, on uh, your advocacy for downtown uh, Far Rockaway. So I think with that example, expanding that for the council members, I think each one of us would like to bring in. Uh, I think Councilmember Wendy, you have, I want to get to your question before you take off. So we have we have um, each of the boroughs that are represented here, and I think you outlined some of the projects that EDC were mm -hmm. focusing on. So I'd like to turn it over to the council members for. Um, questions about their district and or their borough. So, Council Member Landon, you have some questions? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Sorry, I didn't mean to be uh, moving to get too you quickly, but I appreciate it. And thank you for chairing this committee. I uh, served on it in my first term. I took a term uh, off it, and I'm glad to be back here. And thanks for doing this hearing in a way that sort of sets us up to look broadly at what EDC is up to. And um, uh, it's nice to be back with, with uh, the president and some friends from EDC. Um, there's a couple areas that I don't know that I'll ask about today, but that I think uh, would be great to drill down on in future hearings. Certainly one thing we've spent a lot of time on in this committee is um, I the connections to make sure that New Yorkers uh, get access to the jobs that EDC right. is helping to create. And I know there's some programs, Higher NYC and a number of others. It'd be really great to get kind of deeper updates on. That's hard work to do and make sure we're doing it well. Um, this council's got a, a good long-standing interest in supporting uh, manufacturing and kind of new models of manu manufacturing and job generating activity and I know EDC in some cases in partnership with city planning has been looking at mixed-use models and other ways of encouraging that to happen both in some of their own uh, real estate but also in private real estate. Um, so those are, those are two things I'd love in, in future hearings to kind of drill down on and I'm happy to get general information yeah. on them. Um, um, but I do want to follow up a little bit more on Amazon, your earlier question, um, because while I agree that it would be wonderful to give New Yorkers access to jobs, there are some questions there, and I guess I just want to ask them as well. I, I assume you've seen this letter that um, Richard Florida and others have been circulating. I guess I'll put kind of two different baskets of concerns. One is about this sort of war between cities, a kind of a race to the bottom to offer subsidies upon subsidies. You know, some cities uh, have offered north of $7 billion in tax incentives, more than Amazon is proposing to invest. Yeah. Um, and, you know, and Amazon has constructed this competition in a way to encourage cities to bid against each other, um, to hollow out their own tax bases. I'm glad that New York City has not sort of participated in that bidding war, but I wonder if you've seen this letter. And it's kind of economists from left, right, and center, Richard yeah. Florida, Bruce Katz, Robert Reich, but also Ed Glazer, sort of a pretty yeah. wide range of economists and some local folks saying, yes, cities should sign on to a non-aggression pact uh, and commit not to underbid and offer this just panoply of, of subsidies that I think once upon a time were the way that places like EDC did business. And I'm, I've been encouraged that EDC has moved away from that. And I want to make sure we're not moving back to it. And then on the flip side, while there are some great things about those jobs, there's some real challenges that would be created. I mean, we already have a, you know, there's a mayor who talks about as much as any of us, a massive affordable housing crisis. Mm -hmm. Um, and obviously Seattle has, you know, it's very clear that Amazon would exacerbate that. That's not a reason not to be enthusiastic about them coming, but it is a reason to make sure that we are making demands of them and not just letting them make demands of us. So if they want to come here, I want to know what they're going to do to make sure we don't undermine housing affordability for working class New Yorkers. What are we going to do about transit in an already strained subway system? Uh, so I guess just you know how you know help help me feel less uh, anxious about okay great about this. Um, so uh, thank you. Um, always good to see you. Um, I appreciate how much uh, thought you always give to these issues. Um, so I would love to talk more about uh, local hiring and and industrial projects because I totally I mean I think we're largely very aligned on what we want to see in those, um, but that's not the focus of your question. So I will talk about Amazon. Um, so, 
Um, I have seen the letter, um, and I agree, absolutely. I mean, I think that the, it's, the, it's the bad past of economic development, um, which is one in which, you know, different cities have to you know, create a race to the bottom. Um, I think it's a, you know, it's an understandable tactic um, to, you know, try and get the best deal. I sort of can't blame Amazon for that, but I, 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 I guess I, you know, I, it's, it's, hard, it's always hard for everyone to stand up. When you're a city like Newark, or a city like Detroit, I have more sympathy for them um, in wanting to offer t uh, tax breaks or do whatever they can to encourage an opportunity like Amazon to come to their city because the truth of the matter is, um, you know, they need every opportunity for their residents that they can find. So I don't want to, I don't want to judge them. I just um, want to say from our perspective, it's not the way that we approach the world of economic development these days. And that's partly because we come from a place of strength, right? It's because Everybody wants to be in New York because they see the value of New York City, and that's how we're going to play this game. We're going to play the game on our terms and put forward our value proposition, which is that we have the most diverse, most dynamic, uh, talented population in the country. Um, and I would put our talent pool up against anyone and, and argue that we should win. Um, and that's exactly what we're going to do here. The mo more than anything, this is a competition for talent. Um, and I, again, I believe we have the greatest talent. And I also think um, this is a moment in time for companies, larger tech companies, to really t figure out what they're about, um, an opportunity to diversify the workforce um, in the tech industry. And I think a decision to come to New York City would be a statement that Amazon is committed to diversifying its workforce. Um, so, um, you know, as relates to the, the economic incentives, you know, that's not the game that we're going to play, but we are going to absolutely, and we already are talking to all of our academic institutions, you know, most importantly, CUNY, about how, if Amazon decides to come here, we can ensure that our students get an opportunity to get those jobs. Um, and that's something we've said from the beginning um, in our proposal to Amazon, and which we'll say to them as the conversation evolves, which is, if this is a two-way street, right? If you're going to come to our city, this is not just on your terms, it's on our terms. We understand that you have needs, but we also have needs. This needs to be about our residents. Um, I am encouraged by the fact that what they're looking for is talent, because the fact that they're looking for talent, that means that they want people. They don't, they're not going to import 50,000 people from Seattle. They're going to come looking for hire people, <clears throat> and I want to convince them that they should come here with the understanding they would hire you know, our people, New Yorkers, um, you know, from, from every borough, from every a academic and educational background. <clears throat> you know, as it relates to the housing affordability issues, um, yeah, I guess I would say, um, you know, housing is critical and essential, but it's not enough to make a successful life. You also need a good paying job. Um, and so all of these things are balanced, right? As the economy does better in New York City and people get paid better, housing prices go up and it's a balance and it's policymakers' obligation to balance those things. I think at the end of the day, any decision about Amazon needs to be balanced. We need to evaluate, at, do we believe that this would be enough of an economic benefit to the city from a jobs perspective, getting more people into good jobs, that it would outweigh any concerns about the impact on housing. Um, I think that's a balancing act. I believe that that is, certainly has that potential, but you know, I think it's a, it, it just depends on their willingness to commit to hiring people out of our, you know, our institutions and really hiring New Yorkers for these jobs. Um, and then on the last point about transit, I, 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 I think it really depends on where they decide to locate um, if they decide to come to New York City. So we identified four geographies, Long Island City, Midtown West, Lower Manhattan, and Downtown Brooklyn. You know, I think if anyone locating in Midtown West or, you know, Lower Manhattan, I don't, I don't have significant transportation concerns about those areas. Um, I mean, they're incredibly well served by transit. Downtown Brooklyn also quite well. I think in Long Island City, you know, we would need to make sure that this was done uh, in partnership with some infrastructure investments to support the local community. And frankly, I think that would have to be the case anywhere, which is what, you know, <clears throat> what does the, what would the community need to, um, you know, handle the, the change. And so we're certainly committed to ensuring that's a part of any package. So we have a large committee with 13 council members. So thank you, Council Member Lander. I want to make sure each of the council members get a chance yeah. while uh, President Patch is here. Council Member Barron. And we've also been joined by Council Member Cornegie. Thank you for making it. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Look forward to working with you. I did have the pleasure of serving on this committee last session, so I'll look forward to continuing the work that we've been doing. Me too. Uh, thank you for coming, and I have just a couple of questions. Uh, in, your, in your testimony, 
you say that you have, um, you own and manage lots. Yes, 60 develop. million square feet. Say again? 60 million square feet. 60 million square feet. What's the value of that 60 million square feet? Uh, we haven't, we, we don't, I don't look at it that way. I don't have a, a appraisal of it because I mean, as I view it, the value of it is, we're not trying to use it for the highest and best use. We're trying to use it to maximally serve New Yorkers. So you don't have a dollar appraisal? I don't can, know. Can I don't, we get I'm, that? I'm not, uh, I mean, we could. I just don't, I'm, I'd be interested to know the, the value of it, I, the purpose of it, only because I don't have any intention of, you know, disposing of our industrial prop properties or trying to sell them. It's our intention to make sure that those spaces continue to provide uh, jobs to New Yorkers. So at our properties, what we do um, is we offer affordable rents to businesses so that they can afford to stay in the city and hire, um, you know, hire more people at good wages. So you know, whether you know the value of that property is, you know, a hundred million dollars or five million dollars, it's my it's our commitment to ensure that the rents that we offer are affordable so people can. Well, wouldn't the value yeah. help to determine how you could uh, adjust the rents? Oh, sure, the certainly, absolutely. So we're well aware of the value the the market rent for each of our spaces, but not the this for the 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 value that the property would get if we sold it just because we're not thinking about selling our properties. We believe they should continue to be publicly owned. But yes, for every, for we do regularly appraisals on all of our properties um, for what the market rent is that should be, that would be paid by a tenant um, who would come to uh, use that facility. There, a couple of questions then. Yeah. There uh, is property which is owned and the city is going to be developing it. It's in East New York, actually the Brownsville Carter area and uh, there will be an increase, a significant increase in the rents mm -hmm. that the present uh, owners, the present renters, or the leases are paying. Mm -hmm. So how can we look to see what that adjustment is? Because they're going to be paying more mm -hmm. after this adjustment. Are you familiar with the uh, I'm, yeah, site? I'm, I'm familiar with the project you're referring to. Right. So we're, so absolutely. So I think the, um, I believe you're referring to the, the uni uniform company? Yes. Okay. So. Um, First, I would say it's we're working very closely with that company to ensure that whatever outcome um, is works for them. Uh, the we we heard their concerns very clearly, and I think the the original plan, as articulated, didn't make a lot of sense to be honest with you. But um, and you know we've been talking to the mayor about that as well. Um, the that being said, th this is all a result of the fact that that facility is falling apart and the roof is crumbling. So we need to make sure that the city is investing funds to bring the facility up to code to be safe for them, to, to, for them and others to be able to continue to operate their business. But we are very focused on ensuring that that business, um, you know, is able to continue to operate and be successful. Okay. And as you know, uh, the East New York rezoning plan had lots of commitments that were made yes. to the community. And I wanted to know in terms of the commitments that are required of EDC, where we are, for example, uh, there's, it says renovate the city owned industrial buildings, to create modern industrial space for six industrial companies. So is that a part that's the one of we that? Just that's the one we just referred to, yes. Okay, and then another one that has a dollar, I'm particularly concerned about the ones that have a dollar amount attached to them. Bring affordable high-speed broadband to businesses in the IBZ. Mm -hmm. And that was targeted to start um, this year going on to 2020. Yeah. So can you give us a plan of where that is? And is there a way that we can look online to see how the timetable is being addressed mm -hmm. for sorry, the things sorry, that have to be so done? The document I think you have in front of you is a on, online system that the council established to keep track of all of these commitments. Right. So you know that will continue to be um, updated to reflect but as relates to this broadband specifically, you know, that was committed to be started this year and we're still very focused on beginning the work on that this year. But it's not supposed to be completed, I think, until for a couple of years. And lastly, in terms of uh, MWBEs, yes. your testimony indicates that in, last, in fiscal 17, it was $118 million that was mm -hmm. awarded. That's right. Do we know how much of that was awarded to companies that are uh, run by blacks in particular? I know it's MWBE. Mm. Do we have a breakout for 
committees? Uh, um, I don't I don't have it in front of me, but I certainly can tell you that the our largest contractor is um, McKissick, McKissick um, which is run by a black okay. woman. Yes, um, and, and they're and one of our main contractors. Yes. We use them okay. for. They've a been lot around a long time, and of the contracts that are awarded. What percentage of contracts at $1 million or greater are awarded to MWBEs? $1 million and perhaps at $5 million? Mm -hmm. I, I, don't, I don't know the answer off the top of my head, but I will, we will send that to you um, as a follow-up. Um, but what I will say is, you know, as, as you are well aware, that, that we, what we want to make sure is that we're awarding large-scale contracts. Um, but also smaller scale contracts so that we can create more ladders for uh, MWBEs to grow their businesses, which is one of the reasons why we started the Construct NYC program, which was to break down the, the, one of the traditional challenges for MWBEs of getting into um, the construction business is that they weren't able to compete for the larger contracts because they didn't have the track record. So what EDC did was we took an initiative to break apart our contracts um, into smaller bite-sized pieces and offer them specifically to MWBEs so that they could do capacity building, get those contracts, demonstrate a track record, and then we could get them into larger and larger contracts over time. And finally, uh, Mr. Chair, what role does East EDC mind. play in bond financing? Bond financing? Yes. Um, so yes, so we have a, uh, we're, for bond, pro bond financing for not-for-profit entities, um, we're heavily involved. We have a separate organization that's affiliated with EDC called the Build, Build NYC, which is a, a financing vehicle for bonds for uh, not-for-profit entities. Do you only give bond financing to not-for-profits? Uh, that entity is only statutorily that can one, only but do provide. You, does EDC only give to not-for-profits? Generally speaking, yes. But there are times that perhaps, you said generally speaking. Well, there only, I mean, technically, so there's a, there's a limited volume of, of um, it's called volume cap that's available to every state that can be used for, to provide private businesses. But it can, it's, it's a trade-off between using it for businesses or affordable housing. Um, it's generally more economically efficient because it produ produces a higher subsidy from the federal government to use it for affordable housing instead of businesses. Um, but technically, it can be used for businesses. Traditionally, it's been my position that it should be used for affordable housing instead of for business finance, since it's a relatively limited resource um, and we have such a need for affordable housing. Um, and so we have traditionally given our allocation over to the Housing Development Corporation so it can be used for 100% affordable housing. And if any council member has to submit questions afterwards, then please send them to us and we'll make sure we get answers. Or if there are unanswered questions, which I'm sure we may have. But thank that you, concludes my Bear. questions. Right. Thank you. So thank we're going to have you, Mr. Council Chair. Member Koo and then Council Member Powers after Peter. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Valong, and thank you, Mr. Patrick from EDC you. coming. I always believe EDC is one of the most important agencies in New York because economic development is very, very important. No. Uh, so my question is, uh, uh, the mayor and EDC just announced, uh, uh, I think today, right? EDC, the, oh, sorry, the mayor uh, and who, us? Mayor and EDC just announced that uh, you're going to be develop Willis Point. Oh, yes. Uh, yeah. And we'll create uh, 11,000 apartment building, uh, apartments, affordable apartments. So uh, my question is, how will the community preference for those apartments uh, be, uh, being uh, broken down? Uh, just between commutable three, four, and uh, what about commutable seven? Uh, the reason I bring that up because when uh, we build affordable housing in Flushing, uh, the one, uh, one Flushing, Mm -hmm. uh, f uh, it was agreed like four, maybe five years ago on, on contract. Uh, we let uh, commutable three and four to have some quotas mm -hmm. of, of our uh, affordable housing, which is totally in commutable seven. Mm -hmm. So I want like, some reciprocity mm -hmm. this time um, right. when they build that uh, affordable housing in Villas Point. Right. Well, so, I think that, that brings us to Willett's point. So if you want to give us maybe a little summary of the announcement that was yeah. made today, the units that are expected, and I believe we have phase A and phase B and mm -hmm. phase one and two. So yep. I think if you can give us a little update. Sure, I'll, I'll, I'll give the general overview yeah. and then go to your question, sure. So, so yes. Yeah, so Joined by Councilmember Williams. 
So, um, so th yes, so the, this morning um, we announced, the administration announced we were successfully able to reach an agreement um, with uh, the, you know, our, our, the borough president and the council member, uh, the chair, um, and other community leaders, as well as the developer to advance um, the construction of a first phase of Willits Point. Um, so, you know, this was a deal that was originally announced in 2013, which contemplated a total of 2,475 units of housing, 875 of which would have been affordable. Um, and those 875 units were intended to be scattered across the entire project. This morning, we announced the first phase will be 1,100 units, 100% affordable, as a, just a first phase on the first six acres. Um, so that is m more affordable housing units than was envisioned in the entire project um, are being provided in just the first phase. So we think that's a great step. Um, the, uh, those 1,100 units break down um, in, in a range of incomes. Uh, about close to 200 of them serve folks uh, below 30% of area median income. Um, uh, 220 of them are, uh, another 220 of them are uh, at about 50% of area median income and they go all the way up to about 300 units uh, between 100 and 130% of area median income. So it's a really a wide range of incomes up to 130%. Um, the, uh, so you know, we think it's a really great first step to move the project ahead and I think most importantly it also includes a 450 seat school um, as well as uh, open space which were critical components of what the original community uh, plan and the, the rezoning uh, Euler uh, was looking for um, when with council member Ferreras at the time. So 1100 units, seniors, veterans, or any percentage set aside for? There is, there, there is going to be a set aside for seniors um, and there's also going to be a set aside for homeless. Um, but as far as, and, and you know, veterans are, there's not a specific veteran set aside, but they are often accommodated in each of those preferences. Um, so, uh, you know, as, so as council member, as it relates to your question, so, you know, community preference, you know, as you know, the city is currently in, in, in litigation um, on community preference. Uh, and, you know, we're, we're very focused on ensuring that we can, you know, ensure that the you know, people who are at risk of, um, you know, being displaced from their communities can be served by the affordable housing that's being built in their communities. And that's why community preference is an important policy to the city where it can be used to offset, um, you know, offsets the impacts of displacement. Um, and so it's something we're committed to. In terms of the way the community preference will work in, the, in this situation, um, you know, generally speaking, it's focused on the immediate community board or within a mile of the project. Um, but I think, you know, we're, the HPD oversees the community preference and we will be happy to have a conversation with you and with them to try and make sure the community preference is serving the community as effectively as possible. Because our community is really concerned about this uh, uh, allocation of the units. Mm -hmm. Because like, like, I just, like, last time I said before, you know, when we have first one, we, uh, we have allocation for other community boards. Mm -hmm. but, but the bu building is totally in my district, but we allow them to share. So I hope this time uh, they will give uh, community board seven a better share. So, okay. Because otherwise a lot of people get angry. You know. Understood. Uh, yep. Uh, and Council Member Koo, we, we emphasize this morning when we have releases like these that we be included. Um, this site, I think, specifically, especially since it's a huge opportunity yeah. for the whole city, not just Queens, and I think almost every Queens Council Member has uh, an impact mm -hmm. of the growth of it. So while affordable housing is completely needed, there is so many aspects to where it's beyond Absolutely. affordable housing, and I think that's where the concerns of Community Board 7 and right. the police departments and the school seats mm -hmm. that are overcrowded um, have to all be incorporated Absolutely. to make sure we keep that transparency, um, especially the community community board wants to make sure they're involved with that. So okay. just to finish on Willits, you said there were two other components, the open space mm -hmm. and the schools. So yes. Any idea where the open, what the open spaces will look like or what the future of those will be? So, so as well as the school, the school is 450 seats targeted at K to five. Um, will we have the ability to expand that? If so, with, so, with the future of the site, because yes, so, we, so we see a hopeful campus, you know, we'd like to really make sure this. Yeah, so, so I think that's exactly right, which is that, as, you know, this is only six of the of 23 acres. So I think 
we may have to make sure that the rest of the development continues to address the concerns of the community in terms of infrastructure. Uh, with, you know, obviously streets are critical, making sure that there's sufficient uh, transit infrastructure, but you know, at schools, um, anytime we move forward with the development, we need to make sure that we're serving the, um, you know, the expectations and the need that's created by additional housing units being brought to the community. So absolutely, there's a potential as, as the project expands to meet the needs um, and of the. So using, I guess, using this project as an example for all of us, mm -hmm. you're going to have interagency cooperation and yes. developing a site like this. What, what is the next step with DOT and buildings and, and public safety? I mean, the, there's been traffic studies for all the impacts for these projects that we're yeah. talking about. College Point, and specific, just did a million dollar College Point traffic study yes. where there's tens of millions of dollars, if not hundreds of millions, of infrastructure to streets that need to be mm -hmm. done. So does E2C step into the shoes of those projects? Do they coordinate with the other agencies? How to mm -hmm. walk us through that? Yeah, so in, in an example like this, where, we, where, we're re, where EDC is leading a redevelopment, we bring all of our partner agencies to the table to develop a comprehensive plan for the community. So, you know, in this example, um, you know, there's, you know, as, you, as you're well aware, there's going to be a um, steering committee um, being formed to help, you know, to work with closely with the local community, um, um, which... I know you're going to be a member of this. I hope you're going to be a member of the steering committee. Oh, we'll be there. Yes, I'm, I'm counting on it. Um, uh, so you know, we're going to be working very closely with you and the other uh, you know, local community uh, representatives to understand what the priorities are. If those are public safety issues or transportation issues or education issues, we will absolutely bring those partners to the table. The, you know, we worked very closely with the School Construction Authority on the, on the, the plan for this 450 seats. You know, they identified the need for a K to five educational facility now. Um, and I've also heard the, com the community has concerns about going forward, the need for potential more um, junior high or high school seats in the community. So if that's something that comes out of this process, we'll absolutely bring SCA and DOE to the table to have that discussion. Same goes for PD or DEP or whomever is needed to make sure it's a comprehensive plan. I mean, just to go back to the Far Rockaway example, you know, we had DEP, we had DOT, we had everyone at the table for, at HPD for, for that discussion. So I, I think in fairness to the council members, th this is a separate hearing and conversation because of the scope of this project of is so huge. So I think this is a good introduction to it. Yeah. And just that I think we're all on the same page that the inclusion of this project going forward. Yeah. And I, I, have, I have a related last, question. Last question. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, Emma, your agency has created 630 uh, jobs for registered workers on this particular development project. Uh, but, uh, how can people register? For, for which project you're referring to? The, you, this one. The in the briefings, you, you mentioned uh, the oh. NYEDC has created 630 jobs for registered workers on uh, Willis Point with, with, with development. What, sorry, just so, so what, My question is how can people Council register? Council Member Powers, your next. <laughs> what are you referencing? I'm sorry. I think how, how would it, an, a worker apply for those jobs that are going to be available at the site? The six hundred. I just want. We're, I just want to make sure I know which. It. It says. We, I mean, we, have, we haven't created any jobs at Willits Point yet, unfortunately. EX EDC has also created six hundred thirty jobs for registered workers as a critical component of redevelopment project. Which? It's under the Willits Point paragraph. But you know what? Maybe we'll get back to that. Yeah. And I don't want to lose Councilmember Powers. So let's, while you're working at that, why don't we give Councilmember Powers? Yes. Chance? Thank you. Which? Any you're time. Sorry. Just sorry, Are you looking at my testimony? I think it was the briefing paper. In, oh. in my briefing paper. Yeah. Oh, okay, your briefing paper. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. okay There's so know. many papers up here. From the council, yeah. Well, I, 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 can I just quickly answer this? Just I can share this with you. Go ahead. Okay. Well, I was going to say, which is, so the, we have a program for all, pro, all projects that, um, that we work. We have uh, this program that Councilmember Lander referenced, which is the Higher NYC program. So we expect employers to post their jobs as a part of that through our workforce development system. The workforce development system is, you know, the workforce one system that's administered by the Department of Small Business Services. So in, pe people who are interested in applying for those jobs can go into any workforce one center and apply for those jobs directly. Okay. Thank, Thank you, and congratulations to our new chair and on your first hearing. Uh, I had a couple questions. I want to first uh, just echo Councilmember Lander's sentiment about the Amazon deal and similar types of deals that sometimes seem attractive uh, on paper and through through headlines, but often cost 
uh, lots of money and uh, can cause our constituents some concern about how we're spending dollars. But I do share the note that I think EDC has done a good job in, in recent years of, I think, of, of curtailing those types of things. But that being said, can you give us a little more, I'm just curious, on the Amazon, what is the timeline of that? I think you might say, but I missed it. But And also, what are the incentives that we're, we're looking at or offering, or maybe just a big, bigger picture of that? That's my first question. My second question, well, let's, ask, let's do that, and then I'll ask Paul. Sounds good. Yeah. So um, the timeline is um, Amazon has said they're going to make a decision this year. Okay. So we'll have a decision this year from them. Um, as far as incentives, the city is offering no financial incentives to Amazon. So I think it, I think it is just we're, we're we're staying true to the word of the you know of the policy that's being articulated by the oh. economists. We're not we're not offering any discretion. Zero dollars. Zero dollars. Just the bright lights of New York City, and I think we actually are changing. We changed our lights, I think, too. Yeah, but that was it. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, just okay. the bright orange Good. lights of New York City. That's Good. right. Good. I appreciate that, and that's and that's encouraging. Um, uh, the second question, I want to go to the New York Works uh, uh, program that I know you guys have done hearings on in the past. My predecessor, my my predecessor, and yes. Paul's predecessor as chair had um, had had you know, done a hearing on this. Um, just updates. I remember them well, yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 I know you do. Yeah. Um, I'll tell them you said hello. Uh, 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 just updates on that, and I just some further questions on that. I mean, how, how are we measuring 100,000 jobs? Mm -hmm. How, what projects to get included in mm -hmm. that, type, that type of um, uh, measurement? Mm -hmm. How are we studying it? What's our timeline? You know, just kind of a, an update on, on, on that. Sure. So, um, thank you. Um, you're, you're doing your predecessor proud. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> Dan would be pleased. Um, so, um, so, um, so, so the, in the jobs plan, the New York Works plan, we articulated uh, four key sectors we were focused on: um, technology, life sciences and healthcare, industrial and manufacturing, and the creative economy. Um, so each of those had a jobs target associated with, with them. Um, and we identified a number of initiatives that we, that we knew as of day one that we were going to undertake, but we also recognized that it's a 10-year plan, and so we hadn't articulated every single thing that we would do over the course of 10 years. Um, I'll give, so we've made a lot of progress on each of those. Just to give an, I'll give a couple of examples. Um, the cybersecurity, uh, so in technology, we've really focused on expanding the cybersecurity sector. Um, we just released uh, requests for proposals um, uh, with responses that are due, um, I think, next week, February 16th. Um, we're, it's going to be a hub for cybersecurity that brings together um, companies with um, academic institutions, or we're, we're optimistic that it will be, um, companies with academic institutions um, so we can connect the talent in New York City and create more more job opportunities in this, what we know is going to be a growing sector. It's a great example of where we're focused on investing through the plan in sectors that we know are going to be job creators in the future. Um, in life sciences and healthcare, we, we talked about that for a while. I won't you know, go into more detail above and beyond what we discussed, but just to say to this morning, um, we got approved at our board our an internship program, um, which is going to provide the, uh, internships, paid internships to uh, New York college students to get jobs in the life sciences whereas they otherwise might not have had opportunities. For larger employers, we are um, counting on the employers to pay for the internships, but the city is picking up the tab for smaller employers because we recognize that can be a financial burden for them. Um, in industrial and manufacturing, <coughs> we just received our um, certificate of occupancy for half a million square feet at the Brooklyn Army Terminal. Uh, we are going to make that space fully available to industrial companies that are hiring New Yorkers. Um, you know, as I mentioned, it's going to be at affordable uh, rental rates, and that's, you know, we have over, well over a thousand jobs we should be able to move into there as we, uh, you know, start to tenant it up this year. Um, and finally, in the creative sector, uh, we announced the creation of our virtual reality and augmented reality lab, which I think is another example of where we're thinking about the future and the way the technology is going to change. That's like uh, City Hall. Yeah. Augmented reality. Have you guys tried the new <laughs> augmented? <laughs> have you guys tried this new augmented I have not. reality? We is could like make James appear via our phones. Yeah, right. Don't tell our you can talk to me in your own home. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, it's, 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 I think that's important because it's going to change every every industry, um, which is I think you know the, the actually at the uh, council member Grodnick was at the um, at the. Um, kickoff for that event, um, and the great example that he gave was imagine 
being in your own home and being able to go visit the Metropolitan Museum of Art just by you know, walking around your living room but putting on a pair of goggles and being able to see it. So imagine how that's going to affect our cultural institutions, how it's going to affect the media industry. Um, it's obviously going to affect, it's, it's affecting um, healthcare, the way people are doing surgery. So it's just impacting every industry. So we have to be a leader in the field. We have to be creating jobs um, in that field because we know that we're going to it's going to impact other industries. And, and the 100,000 jobs, how many of those come from like direct EDC investment, ta you know, so like subsidies or investment in life sciences and uh -huh. property versus what we would expect from a normal growth over the time period in terms of jobs? They're, and, they're and all direct as a result. They're, they're all direct result of specific initiative that we've undertaken. None of them are from um, you know, just sort of expected economic growth. So we're talking about above and beyond what would ordinarily happen, specific EDC initiatives. So then, let's see, so then if Amazon comes, mm -hmm. that doesn't count to your number. I haven't, I mean, if Amazon comes, um, I think I can just retire. Um, yeah. I, I don't know, I, 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 haven't, I haven't thought in, in detail, the Amazon case is a, you know, I think it's a good example of we didn't know all the things that we would do. I mean, it depends what's required. I mean, I don't want to go through the technicality of the counting rules. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, I think, it, you know, it doesn't, I will say, we're not, we're not saying we have to be giving subsidy in order to get someone to, because I don't want to be in a scenario where right, subsidy right. is the way that yeah, we get right. to count sure. jobs. Sure. Um, so I think there are a lot of other things it's conceivable yeah. we could end up doing that would make Amazon come. I mean, trust me, we've done a lot of work on it, um, and they would not be coming without EDC, I can tell you that, um, given the, the hundreds and hundreds of hours our staff has put into it, but I haven't actually thought through technically whether or not it would count. I'll give you guys credit for it if yeah. they do come, okay, but uh, uh, it wasn't meant to be a gotcha question. I was yeah, just yeah. trying to measure no, how exactly. you guys are yeah. counting on that. Right. Um, uh, last question, and you know what, I'll, actually, I'll pause and I'll come back. Cause okay, yeah, so the list that we have, so Council Member Rosenthal is going to continue, then uh, Council Member Adams, Richards, Cornegie, Rivera, Williams, and then We'll let Peter finish this off the second round. So, Councilmember Rosenthal, please. Thank you so much, Chair Valone. Congratulations on your new chairmanship. So, I have four quick questions. I'm going to do it like this. All right, this. let's do Don't it. Don't tease us, Ellen. This um, is the helicopter, you may or may not be aware, I think it was before your tenure, we negotiated with yes. the EDC a helicopter, a quarterly helicopter report. You know, when I hear the word report, I sort of think it'll be, you know, a report. A report. But it, instead, what we get is one sentence that says mm. everything's operating as we mm -hmm. agreed to. Okay. And it's a little thin, and we're still <laughs> getting complaints from oh. residents about helicopters on Sundays, after hours, um, you know, what we had intended, which was an overall 50% decline, we're not seeing on the ground. So. Mm. Um, we also said that after we achieved our goals, which according to the report we have, we would start to talk about noise and air pollution mitigation. Mm -hmm. I feel like we're at that point, mm -hmm. and I just wanted to get a confirmation from you guys that you'd be willing to take this up again. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a complicated topic. Um, the, the, I think we're thrilled that we were able to reduce the, the flight volume from the lower Manhattan heliport by 50%. I mean, that was the goal. We know that we've done that. Um, How do you I, know that? Um, just because of the, I mean, we actually do have data that talks about the number of flights that depart from the, the heliport, and we track it quite closely. So I'd we actually, love to see that. Okay. Yeah, we're absolutely happy to share that with Great. you. Great. Um, you know, I, I, we frequently get complaints from people who are um, in New Jersey um, or, and who are complaining about New York City tourist helicopters. Um, they're, and they often will send us, the, I'm, just, I'm just telling you. I got you. you. There's lots There's of confusion. A lot of people. Is it the charter exactly. planes from the west side, mm -hmm. you know, take off? I got you. I just, I think it's time for us to dig in a little, Understood. if that's possible. Yeah. Now, so how, I Great. join with you because the helicopter issue is a huge issue for Northeast Queens and the oh. charter flights. So we will have substantial either hearing or additional steps on what to do with our helicopter plague at the moment. So I feel hearing ahead. coming on. Hearing okay. Oh, Secondly, the MWBE number that yes. you reported to my colleague, uh, 100 and something thousand million. Uh, yep. Million? 118 million. And that's out of a total of how much? Um, I think it's a total of about um, 500 million or so. It's about, I mean, if you, for percentage so it's wise, it's about, it's, 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 close, it's close to 25%. Wow. Is that a, uh, a one year look or a. That's, over that's, over, that's fiscal year 17. 
So it's not over the life of a project. It's, it's just that one look. Well, over the life of, I mean, the, the way it, <laughs> frequently for projects, many projects, it's, it's in the aggregate across EDC. So we look at it on an annual basis, fiscal year basis, um, which is how the goals are set. Because um, over projects, it's often any individu individual project, some will be 80% and others will be 5% or 0%. For sure. So the goal, so it's, I think it's more helpful to look at it on a time basis. Um, you know, our goal is to get to 30%. The mayor set that goal by 2021. Great. And I'm hopeful we can meet, beat that. Okay. And then lastly, um, I want to talk just real quickly about uh, sexual harassment or what I like to call gender-based misconduct because mm -hmm. I want to sort of move away from that expression. As the chair of the Committee on Women, our first hearing is going to be uh, on that topic yeah. and we're going to ask for the sexual harassment policy for each agency. Mm -hmm. Would you be willing for EDC to be included in that? Absolutely. Okay. And would you be able to give information about those uh, companies that we contract with and whether or not they have policies, whether or not they track mm -hmm. complaints and resolution, which is really where we want to go. Mm -hmm. um, I don't, yeah, I, I, I can't speak in detail about the companies. I can, take, I can tell you that we take it very seriously at EDC. Um, I actually sent um, an all staff um, communication about this several months ago, um, and we've, we've set up a whole set of programming around this. One of, I was very happy we had um, Dr. Michael Kimmel, who's one of the foremost um, speakers around um, how to get men to be better supporters of women in the workplace. Um, he came in and spoke to the whole staff for an hour. We had, um, I personally asked people to be there, and I think we had more than 50% of the staff, it was standing room only in our largest conference room. Um, I had an opportunity to introduce him and he gave some really compelling remarks about you know, what men can do to support women in the workplace. And a lot of them, I think, you know, it's, 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 it's obviously, you, it's, it's, it's always challenging um, to know exactly how to support women the right way in the workplace. And I think he gave some very helpful guidance for, for the men in the room and also the women in the room about how to be you know, more empowered. I think it was, it was very helpful. It's just one of the things that we're doing. Um, we also, just in, instituted a new women's leadership program at EDC to try and encourage more um, of our women leaders at EDC to have additional growth opportunities. I think you're doing it, aren't you, Lydia? Um, so it's, I, I, we had our first meeting, um, I think, last week. So it's, you know, we're, we're we take these issues very seriously at EDC. Uh, much better answer than the mayor gave. But can I ask you, <laughs> do you track complaints and the resolution of complaints? At EDC? Yeah. Um, I, I don't... I, I don't know the answer to that. That's to okay. Yeah. And most places don't. Yeah. We're just looking at places with best practices. Mm -hmm. yes. That sounds, I would love to follow up with Absolutely. you. Absolutely. I will tell guy. you, I, what I can tell you is that I, um, one of the most challenging things is obviously the way that who people report to. Um, yeah. And we're very aware of that because people don't necessarily always feel comfortable reporting. Obviously, if you're being harassed by your manager, you don't want to report to your manager. So what we made very clear um, in all of my communications and also has been our head of HR, who's fantastic, have made very clear is that you have many options to report. Yep. It's to any trusted manager that I said, and I've said this, I said this personally to my remarks to the um, staff at EDC, but also in my email communication, our HR team reinforces it. You can report to any manager. That means whether it's the person you work for, another person who's a manager, anyone in my office, myself, um, anyone in the HR department, you have, and because I'm sure you know this, I don't need to tell you, but we're well aware that people often have these conversations in groups of women um, that are m more informal, and we just wanted to make sure that people were empowered enough to be able to talk to someone who could actually register a formal complaint, because one of the biggest challenges is the, the complaint, you know, people not being empowered to report so mm -hmm. that there is an action taken. So we want to make sure that people at EDC are as comfortable as possible to be able to report. Awesome. Uh, true feminist. So if you could give us the number of complaints, mm -hmm. maybe, that were registered mm -hmm. um, yeah. during the life of this administration, mm -hmm. so maybe 2014, 15, 16, 17, so we would capture maybe what was going on before you got in there and, I don't know, just yeah, the sure. number. More Great. Now, I don't, we don't even have to know about resolution, number okay. of complaints. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Roosevelt. And that's a wonderful objective. I think that's a good way. If you're going to do business in New York City, it's a perfect standard that we should hold them to. I think it's great. Council Member Adrian Adams, followed by Donovan Richards. 
Thank you, Chair Vallone, and uh, once again, congratulations to you uh, for chairing this committee. I look forward to great work with you in the future, and I feel uh, honored and privileged to sit here today. Uh, thank you very much, President uh, Patchett, for being here today. Very excited to see you uh, here today. Just wanted to hone in a little bit um, back to uh, the Jamaica Now Action Plan. Mm -hmm. uh, as uh, one of the original co-chairs of the Jamaica Now Leadership Council, that is a project that is very near and dear to me. Uh, and to our constituents in Southeast Queens. So I thank you for your partnership in the past, yeah. and I look forward to our continued relationship in the future. Uh, I feel like I'm part of stewardship of that $153 million, and it is a tremendous, uh, tremendous responsibility for all of us. Just wanted to know, yes, we did uh, very, very uh, intensively come up with those 28 strategies. Mm -hmm. uh, and as you say in your testimony, 18 of which have been uh, launched already. Just curious to know specifically what is left on EDC's plate at this point when it comes to the Jamaica Now Action Plan. Yeah. Uh, and going back to my colleagues' uh, points about M MWBEs, how are you, uh, how are you, have you, or will you fulfill your commitment to MWBE compliance? Right. Um, sure. So, um, you know, I think, as you know, the the actions are not all EDC actions. Thank you for your partnership on that. And and by the way, nice to meet you, um, and congratulations. Um, so, uh, so there, yes, there are 28 um, total strategic actions. Of the 18, we've committed uh, 153 million dollars against them. Um, you know, I think you know uh, the 106th Street. 168th Street uh, Jamaica Garage is, is a great uh, is a great project that's a part of this um, as relates to MWBE that will have a 35% MWBE objective. Um, so I think that's you know a, a really great example. We try to get a 35% MWBE outcome in as many of our projects as we possibly can. Um, I think we'll have to send you as a follow up the list of the 10 other projects and who owns them. But it's something we uh, take very seriously. I just don't happen to have the list in front of me. Okay, thank you. And just uh, one quick follow-up and looking down the road to the work that we have to do with the JFK expansion yes. uh, in the future. And just curious to know, because the corridor is very important to, to us in Queens uh, as a whole, um, what role does EDC play in the LaGuardia redevelopment and what progress has been made so far with that? Basically no role. Um, we, the, the city does... Um, master lease the property to the Port Authority, but the Port Authority has a long-term um, long term lease on the property, so the city has very little involvement, in fact, no involvement in the redevelopment plan. We were kind of hoping we, you did. What's yeah. that? We were kind of hoping you did. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> uh, so do we. Um, really hope so. The, uh, we, do, um, you know, we do have regular conversations with the Port Authority. Mm -hmm. um, we do have a relationship with them that involves um, trying to uh, expand the sort of business targeted marketing at the airports, but beyond that, it's it's fairly limited. Um, and there is a staff member at EDC who's partially funded by the Port Authority um, to work on those issues, but it's it's doesn't tend to about to reach to the point of redevelopment of the airports. Okay, so we won't see you down the road to JFK. So okay. mm -hmm. we're sorry about that. Yeah, sorry to disappoint <laughs> you. Thank you very much. Thank you. And for the uh, advocates sticking around, thank you. This, as our first hearing, we have many eager council members with projects that we would like updates on, so we thank you for staying around. Um, we appreciate it. Councilmember Donovan Richards, followed thank by you. Council Member Corny. Chair, and congratulations thank on you, your new appointment, and I'm glad you're from Queens. You should make sure EDC is putting all of their dollars there. Clearly. Uh, to make sure we continue <laughs> to grow Queens, which actually leads in, uh, I think, the job growth in the city. We beat out Manhattan this year, I think, right? Um, <laughs> Um, so I wanted to dig in a little bit. Uh, so I know we always are talking about jobs, jobs, jobs. And uh, my question is, how are we ensuring that we're connecting uh, residents from low-income communities, public housing, uh, to many of the jobs that we see are, are, that are coming uh, mm -hmm. our way? I, I will just weigh into the Amazon debate a little bit, too. Mm -hmm. um, if we're going to entertain subsidy, we certainly need to ensure there is a pathway uh, to good jobs, but not just good jobs mm -hmm. for goodness sake, but good jobs that will that are also uh, available to communities uh, uh, that suffer from poverty as well. So <laughs> I'm just interested in hearing a little bit of uh, how EDC is really strategically looking at mm -hmm. uh, plugging in uh, our communities as well. Yes. 
Um, so, you know, so you'll be happy to know that we're not entertaining subsidy for Amazon. So, we're, but we still are focused but, on ensuring there's uh, job opportunities for people. But, from they, all but land is also a value. What's that? Land can be a subsidy too, right? So. Uh, it could be. Yeah. Um, <laughs> sure. Yeah. Um, that absolutely. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, you know, as it relates to your question, I mean, it's it's obviously a very important one. It's actually a, a topic that Councilmember Lander. Uh, raised but didn't, we didn't go into detail on it. Um, so jobs are not very useful to anyone if, if, they can't, if, they, if people in our communities can't get them. So what we care about in any of our efforts is making sure that these are jobs that are good quality jobs but also jobs that are you know, accessible um, to New Yorkers um, and that includes people across all five boroughs. So the, the, the most effective tool that we have is a program called Hire NYC which is, means that every, as part of every one of our projects, um, we require the, uh, the, our partners to sign up and post their jobs and make them available through our Workforce One Centers and SBS. So we have a direct connectivity. You can go into a Workforce One Center with SBS and apply for the jobs at our, um, pro at our projects. I think that probably the best example of that where it's most effective is where EDC owns the asset. Um, so in, or it owns the property. So like in the example of the Brooklyn Army Terminal um, in South Brooklyn, we have several million square feet there. Um, all of those businesses are served by our Workforce Development Center, which is located there. Um, and they can directly go in there and apply for jobs at that center. I think that's the best model. Um, but I think, you know, a, a lot of other cases, d different projects, we have to do different things to give people access to jobs. Um, I, you know, I won't go into detail on other projects that we're doing, but you know, the, we are working on a project in Manhattan focused on trying to connect people more to technology jobs by advancing, you know, a, a sort of hub for tech training. Um, so I think it's important that we have constant focus on the workforce development efforts to get people the training they need to get into these industries, and that can't just be for people who come, you know, graduate from Columbia. It has to be for people who are, you know, coming out of our high schools, people with GED degrees, and people with um, uh, degrees from associates degrees from CUNYs as, as well. And I know we always speak about these sort of hubs and mm -hmm. tech hubs coming to the city yes. and you know this always seems to be very Manhattan centric not no offense to Carlina I know, and Keith y'all are from Manhattan um, you know but uh, you know mm -hmm. certainly I would hope that in this yeah. last term that we're really looking at opportunities uh, in the outer boroughs yeah. Uh, as well, Southeast Queens, uh, the Rockaways, um, you know, I always will be the biggest cheerleader there. Um, yeah. But certainly looking at communities like East New York and others where we can really maximize opportunities right. uh, for residents so we're providing that upward mobility for them, right? You know, yes. otherwise we're just spinning our wheels. We're building housing. Mm -hmm. Eventually people won't be able to afford to live there. You know, so I think we should be really thinking about a way mm -hmm. to create a pathway for residents to enjoy yes. the luxury of good jobs. Yeah, absolutely. So, I think, I think, right, I think. Well, it you know, shouldn't be a luxury. Let me not say yes. the luxury of a good job, but a well-deserved <coughs> you know, quality job. Manhattan is not the solution for everything. Um, I think we, I would say having jobs in Manhattan, we need to make sure that those jobs are accessible to everyone. But on top of that, we need to build um, job opportunities in every borough. Um, you referenced East New York. Um, we're actually working very closely with the borough president, uh, the a Brooklyn Borough President um, and Councilmember Espinal to try and evaluate a possibility to grow more jobs around Broadway Junction, which is a major subway mm -hmm. hub mm -hmm. in e Eastern Brooklyn. Um, and the council members encourage us to think about, you know, what are the tools that we can bring to bear? Mm -hmm. One of the tools that we're thinking about doing, which I think is an, is an exciting one, um, is our uh, office anchor strategy, where we are considering relocating uh, workers at city agencies to help anchor a new job focused development in the outer boroughs um, or the other boroughs, the non Manhattan boroughs, um, and, uh, and, and, and then make sure that that can anchor a new development where the rest of it is for jobs that will be available to local community members. So that's one of the ways we're trying to put you know, this, this money that the city is spending uh, on the table to advance development across the whole city. Yeah. Yeah, and thank you for that because I, I know you recognize, such as I do, that most of the growth happening in the city is happening in the outer boroughs. So Absolutely. just making sure there's a focus there. Uh, lastly, I'll just end on some very happy, and I want to thank uh, you and your team uh, for the phenomenal work we did around Far Rockaway. 
Um, it really was a joy to work with you to accomplish so much. And, you know, this is actually one of, I think, as the prior chair of the zoning committee, it was actually a joy to work yeah. uh, through that project with you. And the level of community engagement and focus was uh, great. And it, it is a model that people should look to. Uh, not because I was involved, but it, it is a good model. You did right there. Uh, so last question on that is obviously we had a list of commitments. Mm -hmm. um, so I know we are going through a fiscal capital uh, fiscal year now where we're going to pass a new budget. Yeah. Uh, can I be assured that I'm not going to have to come looking for you uh, <laughs> to find my commitments? No, uh, you will not okay. have to. You can, you can, I'm, you might have to come looking at for me to find them because I find the budget very confusing myself, but, okay. um, but we're happy to point them out to you. Absolutely. We're committed. All the things that okay. we committed to, we are committed to. Okay. So um, I won't have to chase you down, right? Well, if you want to chase me down, you're all okay. welcome to. Um, <laughs> well, you can always take the ferry. Um, okay. <laughs> yeah, but, but uh, the, uh, you know, I just want, I, I want to I just say thank you again, really. I, I, we couldn't be prouder of the the work we did together in downtown Bar Rockaway. As you know, I was referencing it as you walked into the room. Uh, it's an example we cite everywhere. I really we think that it's a model. Yeah. So when I walked in, we timed that just for you, Councilman Rich. Thank you okay. so much, yeah, and I look sure. forward to any other projects, yeah. any other place you want to spend three hundred million in my district. <laughs> I certainly yeah. look forward so to working with you. Now we're going to turn care. over to of Committee on Hospitals, Councilmember Carlina Rivera. Thank you. you. Congrats. Everyone's congratulating you. You're doing a great job. Thank you. Um, I will not be weighing in on Amazon. <laughs> um, so I have, a, okay, a few questions, and I'll try to keep them brief because I know we've been very patient and waiting. Um, you mentioned 550 projects mm -hmm. in your testimony. Yes. Which is a very long list. And I want to know if there is another way besides the web. The website is not nearly enough in terms of your projects, right? And I imagine it would be almost impossible to list every single project that you're working on mm -hmm. for a number of reasons. Um, but I, I would love to see something better in terms of public consumption. How can we access what projects are in our districts and have you considered a filter process or a better version of that in which you can see what's happening, not just maybe in your council district, but in your community board district? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, I'm, uh, sure. Did you, what did you have? No, no, sorry. The, I think absolutely. I mean, I think we're always open to, I mean, at a minimum, I'm happy to sit down with you as, you know, just, and then not, I know it's not what you're saying, but I'm happy to sit down with you and go through a, every property we have um, in your district. And, you know, I, I don't think we have that many things going on. I can think of one um, off the top of my head. But apart from that, I, yeah, um, I'd be happy to share with you any and all potential projects in your district and what we currently have on the table. Um, but I think, you know, absolutely, we're, we, are, we are working towards creating more tools that make it uh, publicly available so that anyone can filter and see exactly what's available um, in their district. I'm not sure uh, where we are in terms of the tech development of that, but I think it's a great point, and we need to be as transparent as possible what's happening across the city. I'm going to take you up on the meeting to okay. sit down. Okay, deal. Okay, just Great. so it's on the record. It is, uh, um, thank I'm, you. Thank you. We'll, we'll schedule it today. There's more than one, too, but we'll get to that. Okay. So, uh, okay, my second question is one of the projects I believe that you are a part of, well, you are definitely a part of this major, um, the Eastside Coastal Resiliency Project, yes. and smaller projects that are all being intertwined, Pier 42, some of the things that are going on in Council Member Powers District. Mm -hmm. And so we experienced some pretty significant delays, 18 months, there's a federal money spend down by 2022. Mm -hmm. And I want to know what is the agency doing to ensure we don't fall behind on the schedule again, that mm -hmm. we're able to access and spend all of those funds in due time and we get the waterfront that our communities deserve. Right. So, I mean, I, so the East Side Coastal Resiliency is a project that's being led by the um, ORR. Yeah. Um, so it's not being led by EDC. I mean, we're, we obviously, we collaborate very closely with, with ORR, but they are really the lead on that project, so they're better prepared to, um, to speak to that. You know, for the, for the federal funding that we received, that EDC specifically was allocated um, as a part of the Sandy relief efforts, um, you know, we have been working very hard to ensure that it's all spent by the federal deadline. We have funding, we had funding for the Rockaway Boardwalk, which we completed already. Um, we uh, received some federal funding for 
the uh, project we call Raise the Shorelines, which is an effort around the city to build higher shorelines, mm -hmm. as you would think. Um, and we are well on track to spend that money ahead of the federal deadline. Uh, we also have funding um, for Hunts Point to make it more resilient. It's their large uh, food market in, in the Southern Bronx. Um, and we are working very aggressively with OMB to make sure we can spend those mo that money ahead of the schedule as well. That's great. And I will uh, say that I also encourage outer borough development. And you're not the only corporation that needs better practices, yeah. but um, we're looking forward to working with you on that. Mm -hmm. So my, my last question, it's, it's a comment and then it's a question. In terms of your relationship with, with the public, again, mm -hmm. so I've had experiences with EDC as an organizer and as a community board member. The first, of course, is uh, with, with your public, your markets, like mm -hmm. the Essex Street Market yes. and the number of markets you have throughout the city. I just want to say that those markets are so incredibly important in terms of their historical relevance and significance and what they re represent to each community culturally. So mm -hmm. uh, the subsidies, the permits, mm -hmm. what, how you work with the, the vendors inside, those markets are really, really important. So I just want to thank you for what you've done thus far, and I look forward to you continuing to support. Uh, and that brings me to my one of my bigger experiences, which is on a project which is technically in Council Member Chin's district, mm -hmm. yep. but it is in uh, Community Board 3, Manhattan, which is the Seward Park Urban Renewal Area, now called Essex Crossing. Mm -hmm. And like uh, Council Member Richards uh, mentioned, there was a number of public benefits that we negotiated as a community and with the help of our elected officials. So when we're looking at public benefits, and typically they get memorialized in the press, and of course we have the list of them handy to make sure that they are delivered. Yeah. Um, I'm interested in knowing whether there are any plans for some sort of public monitoring or reporting system in which people are going to be able to access those public benefits and see, hey, w there is $10 million coming to a new workforce center in our neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Where are they on that? And they can follow up with us or with the local community board. Mm -hmm. But I, I do feel like that there could be increased transparency in terms of the list of those commitments, and I think it would also be a really great look in terms of improving EDC's relationship with the public. Right. Are there any plans for something like that that would be a little bit easy to digest? And forgive me if I don't know if one exists. Okay. No, no, no. It's fine. So you're, you're talking about specifically about Essex Street? Essex no, no, I'm asking just oh, about general. public benefits. Oh, sure. And so, their, yeah, so, right. yeah, so and as a part, available. sure. So, there is a there's a new tracking system that was created under this administration to monitor public commitments as a part of it's ever a part of every zoning action so i think it was one of the concerns of the council very appropriately that you know there were these commitments that were being made but they weren't publicly shared so now there is a tracking system that was set up through legislation with the council that on a go forward basis for all of these um, you know public commitments will be tracked and the name of the system? Uh, I don't know the name. I don't know. It's a, it's a city council tracking system. What's that? We can sh we'll be happy to share it with that, you. That would be great. Yeah. And I think that if, especially for a, a new council person or, or someone who, you know, I, I think that that would be important information. So the first thing I do when I get inside yeah. the city council is you all call me to talk to me about the projects that are your priorities. Yeah. Whereas I would have loved to sit down and say, here's how you track all the projects in your district and the public benefits. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think sure. that's a better way to break the ice. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm looking forward to, to talking about that and, and making sure that we'll, we track We will that. bring, we, we, we lovingly call it the tracker. Um, and we'll, we'll lovingly bring. I, uh, that'll be hard to Google. So yeah. let me know. I just saw it, so we're talking. So you can actually go to nyc.gov, and I think it's called the Neighborhood Rezoning Commitments Tracker. So that's where I think yeah. you could see a lot, I think, the real time. Stuff. How often is it updated? Uh, I don't know. I forget. I can't. I, we'll be happy to send you right. all the it's, all it's, right. a, it's a citywide. It's not specific to EDC, but it's a great point. Um, I will just say about the markets, thank you for your comment about the markets. We had um, Chair Vallone at our board meeting this morning where we approved um, an additional investment in the markets, a um, cit citywide marketing campaign to make everyone aware of the, the great small businesses, which bring more, it's more funding for public events at the markets to bring more residents into the markets to make sure that they're accessing the businesses that are located there, more marketing so people are aware of the market's presence in the first place. So we are definitely committed to expand, you know, making sure that that's as robust and successful a network as possible. So thank, thank you. you. Well, I, I think that highlights Councilmember Rivera's 
questions and ours concerns. There's such great projects like that that most of us are not aware of. Yes. So I think there's the the vision and the actual reality of what EDC is doing, and then as legislators that we want to bring that to our districts and participate and share yeah. in it with our students and our businesses yeah. and our corridors. So there's work to be done there because mm -hmm. clearly each of the council members is saying, hey, we want to be part of that. Yeah. And it's a great it's a great project. I mean, being at today's board hearing today, I learned more about the vision of projects. But again, if you didn't go, you're not going to know about it. So I think that's, that's very important. Uh, council member Williams. <coughs> Thank you. And I add my congratulations to you as well. Thank you. Very much. Um, Thank you very much for being here. I have just a few questions. I know you, someone asked about the BQX. Um, so I want to know kind of what you've learned so far. I'm sorry I missed the, the answer when it was asked. And I want to know the feasibility of exploring any such thing in other transit-starved uh, communities like along Utica Avenue line. Sure. Um, so the, as, re as relates to the... Um, the BQX, actually, you didn't miss it. It was not asked yet. So you're the winner. Um, <laughs> yeah, I know. I, 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 was, I was expecting this guy to ask. And now joining so, Councilmember Machaca with Councilmember. There we go. So, um, so thank you for asking. So in terms of progress, you know, it's, it's a, obviously the BQX is envisioned is a very large project. It, um, is a, it covers about 17 miles of the city, uh, and we are in the process of doing all of the complex engineering work that is necessary in order to understand um, exactly what's underneath the streets and what possible what what the exact any exact route could take or w which streets any route would go down. So it's it's a complicated project. It also involves um, you know a lot of work with the utilities to understand you know what would necessary what would be necessary to be relocated if we were to build a train over the top um, and some complex engineering work around. You know, what it would cost to build the tracks um, and just make the project a reality. So we're in the process of that. I think we're, clo we're closing in on having that analysis complete. And once we do, we will, we're going to do a you know, comprehensive community engagement process to move the project forward. Um, and we'll be working closely with Councilmember Menchaca, who you know, I know is now running a new task force on the BQX. Um, and then um, uh, you know, as, as to the possibility to do it in other parts of the city, I mean, I think we you certainly um, first, we need to figure out what we're doing on the BQX, but the city absolutely is interested in evaluating new and interesting transit options across the city. Um, I know as it relates to the Utica Avenue corridor, um, the city put in money for the MTA to evaluate the possibility of adding subway service mm -hmm. um, along Utica Avenue. So that's certain, that would be the, obviously the ideal outcome. Do you know where that is? Because huh? we haven't... I can, well, I know about the money, I know about the study, I don't know about the results of the study. Or Neither do I. Um, okay. I. I don't know. I mean, that's, it's, it's not an EDC issue per se, but I, I, I'm well aware of it because we would, we, you know, from my perspective, I would love to see additional transit aven options along Utica Avenue. Um, it certainly would be good for the city's economy. Uh, so I don't, I don't know the status of the study. It's, it's supposed to be conducted by the MTA. But we do... Um, you know, we should absolutely be considering all interesting transit options. That's why we're running the ferry system. That's why we're talking about the BQX, um, and it's why we're, you know, funding the MTA to look at expansion options. Uh, I know someone did ask about New York Works. But, um, yes, I got that question. I have um, some specifics about um, the number of, uh, you know, we're going to advance the number of computer science graduates. Do you have any idea how it's going to affect Brooklyn College? Sorry. Um, could you ask the question again? I'm sorry. Um, it has to do with uh, the plans called for doubling the number of computer, computer science graduates from CUNY mm -hmm. schools. Do you know how it will affect specifically Brooklyn College, which is in my district? I don't know specifically how it will affect Brooklyn College. Um, what it, the concept is that we would be hiring, with the city is helping to pay to hire many more um, pro professors who can teach computer science across the entire CUNY system. Um, we don't, I don't think we yet have a breakdown of how it uh, impacts each individual college, but it would be spread across the system, so it should benefit uh, all of the schools. And I know they're trying to expand the Steiner Studios um, in um, the Brooklyn uh, Navy Yard. Brooklyn College has a um, film grad, of grad school program there. So do you know where they are on the status of the expansion? I don't. The Brooklyn Navy Yard is not under EDC's jurisdiction. Okay. Um, the um, South Brooklyn Marine Terminal, I know we've been yes, talking, a, yes. um, and I thank Councilman Machaca for working with me, in, but I have a company, Plaza Automalls, has to remain on SB empty storage lot until September when the parking garage on Notion will be completed. 
Can you give any update on that? And also, how many of the current businesses working out of that area will have to be re relocated? Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, right now, the, the, the um, South Brooklyn Marine Terminal is currently you know, largely unused uh, lot in South Brooklyn. Uh, under previous EDC leadership, an agreement was reached with Councilmember Menchaca and the council to, to, to activate it for maritime uses. Um, we are in active conversations to try and make that happen as soon as possible. Um, there is one um, business that, that would be impacted because they have a basically a parking lot um, on the facility and we're working as closely as we can with them to find them a relocation uh, spot. Okay. That's, so that's the only, only company that would be affected? It's only yeah. It's, um, as far as I know, there might be there might be a couple other folks who have parking operations there, but there are no businesses located there. Okay. Well, I hope we can come with something amicable. Yeah. Soon. I appreciate you working with us. Um, the uh, last one, the the, um, the Flatbush Caton Market. Yes. Does Does EDC have a role in the market in the temporary location or just? Redeveloping the new location. We do. Yes, we are. We actually um, were the ones who we actually just did a ribbon cutting on the temporary market, and we um, found this temporary space for them um, in conjunction with our development partners, and it's being provided to them rent free. Is it in the same area in, in my district? That was. Yeah, it's a little bit south of the of the of the uh, you know the main location. Um, it's as close. We wanted to find it as close as possible. Um, so it's it's close. I think. Obviously, the best outcome will be when there is a fully functional, newly built market at the uh, previous site. When was the ribbon cutting? Sorry? When was the ribbon cutting? When was the ribbon cutting? It, it was a couple weeks ago. Okay. All right. What is, so you're going to remain involved with them and the assistance that's needed until? Yes, we will remain involved with them. And how long do you think uh, it, it's going to be needed before the re uh, I, should, I mean, I think it, about two years um, for the construction of the new building. Um, and once there's a new building in its place, we'll get them back into the, you know, the new space as, as soon as possible. As you know, as you know <coughs> the old market was really falling apart, and so this is a real opportunity to create a fantastic new facility for them. Um, and uh, we'll get them back in as soon as we can. And I know if it's in the same location, I know the Civic on the other side has some concerns. Have you met with them and- Who had some just, concerns? It was a civic association that was on the other side of um, where, where the market is. Yeah, hi, Council Member. Um, so we have, we have met with that civic group and are and happy just, to continue working. You could just identify yourself for that. I'm sorry, my name is Lydia Downing. I'm the Senior Vice President for Government and Community Relations. Thank you very much. Um, so yes, we have met with that civic group. We've also been in very close con uh, contact with the community board um, as well as uh, several council offices so I think we um, we want to certainly make sure that we're in touch with everyone make sure that we're that we're good neighbors um, but you know so far so good on the new market okay thank you thank you Mr. thank Chair. you council member Williams and back to council member Koo. now let's be nice we're getting up to two thank hours you. Thank on you, Chair, our president's yeah. testimony I think at three uh, o'clock he turns back into yeah, <laughs> yeah. Sure. Three, thank so. you mr. Uh, mr. president uh, uh, I want to say that the uh, the, my question is on transportation, it's not MTA, you know. Mm -hmm. It's on uh, the ferry system. You know, the ferry has been very successful. Thank you. And as you know, the uh, I've been seeing uh, Flushing, which the population has grown tremendously uh, uh, last 10 years. So our subways, uh, long railroad stations, and buses are at capacity. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's no subway. Uh, in North East Queens, for example, in our chair of Alone's district, uh, there's no subway system there. Means uh, a lot of people, a lot of residents have to come through Fashion to take the subway. Mm -hmm. So I have asked for the city to look at, at alternatives to take the pressure off the number seven train for the last, uh, for over eight years. Uh, so my question is, are there any future plans to expand the ferry system to Flushing or Northeast, Northeast uh, Queens. Mm -hmm. so, Before you jump in, yeah. I, I think it's a perfect time because we've talked about this, um, especially with the no longer we have a waterfronts committee, so we'll probably have to concentrate on a, on a hearing just about our waterfronts and ferries, but echoing Council Member Koo, we've been looking at City Field Marina as a possible extension for the Long Island City uh, with 
Bullets Point, with Long Island City, with all the expansion that's going on in Councilmember Coos District, it's a ready-made location with a park and ride right there. We'd hope to see the next phase of the ferry, and maybe if you could give us an update on that. Sure. Um, I was about to say, uh, Councilmember Coos, that, Council, uh, that Chair Malone has raised um, the notion of a of a of a new uh, ferry stop. Um, you know in the very location you referenced. So we're certainly, certainly something that we are well aware of um, and obviously aware of the transit challenges in Flushing um, and Northeast Queens in general. So as relates to the ferry system today, we are rushing aggressively to get our next two lines up and running this year. So we, start, we launched four lines last summer um, and we're launching two more this year. Uh, we are working on the landings for those. We want to get them all up and running. Uh, we, we said from the beginning, in which we're standing by, is that you know, we need to get the full system up and running to see uh, how it operates before we expand it. Uh, and I think that this, you know, this experience we've had so far is evidence of why that's important. We've had, as you said, enormous success. We've had over three million riders well ahead of what we originally projected. And so it's put a strain on the system. Um, and so we just need to make sure that we successfully get that system up and running, take away all of the things that we've learned from that, and make sure that we can operate that successfully, and then talk about expansion. So that's our plan. We want to get those lines up and running, and then talk about where we can go from there. Well, I think I joined my council member, Ku. Uh, you don't need much of a study to tell you that's going to be a success right there. So hopefully we can get that. I know you've had your hands full. It's generated a ton of your time yeah. dealing with the success of the waterfront. But I think the, our city is a waterfront community. So Absolutely. There's, it's an untapped resource that we can look to alleviate communities like Northeast Queens that do not have. I mean, if there ever was a transportation desert, yep. when you don't have a train, mm -hmm, <laughs> you yeah. have to drive. So in this conversation of congestion pricing and all the rest, if we can provide those alternatives, then it would be a little bit easier for folks in Queens to look at it. Uh, Councilmember Powers. Yep, thank you. And I started big, but I'm going to go a little bit local here. And I'm sorry to take more time from you. Please, um, I'm here for a you. Good, a good segue. Um, in addition to the sort of job creation projects that we have and how to spend or how to, or how to attract and create new jobs, um, in, in areas like in my district, East Midtown, notably Times Square, ongoing issues about congestion and quality of life and other things that at least those doing business in the area feel like threaten the jobs that are in the area or either you know, potentially relocation to places like Long Island City or other places but potentially outside of the New York City too. Mm -hmm. And I wonder as I'm hearing this, I've heard this from a few different groups who are doing in Times Square Alliance and the bids and others about the sort of ongoing impact of um, uh, the you know some, uh, times the chaos around particular neighborhoods and areas. Do, do you guys look at that? Do you have tools to deal with that? How do you guys factor that into any considerations about job and growth for the future? And uh, obviously, I'd love a commitment at some point to sit down with you guys and talk about ways to improve that area, yeah, not just right. zones, but really large, long-term thinking about those areas. And mm -hmm. but. How do you guys look at those areas that are already doing well mm -hmm. and how to sustain growth and make sure we don't lose them to either areas that are in, no offense to these guys, but in areas that are transit deserts or, or less accessible to New Yorkers yeah. or worst case scenario outside of New York City and New York State? Yeah, absolutely. So it's a great point. I mean, we want to keep bringing more jobs. We don't want to lose the ones that we have. Um, so you know, I think you're generally speaking about two major hubs um so yeah, as, as as you're I'm, i know very well aware you know the city in partnership with your predecessor just completed a comprehensive plan for east midtown mm -hmm. um, which included a huge amount of investment in transit infrastructure right. Right. Um, so we're optimistic that that will help to over time alleviate a lot of the concerns in that area as people have you know more ac access to the subways better facilities for the subways um, and also more public plazas and space for them to access yep. um, you know, as it relates to the west side, um, you know, I think you know, Times Square is obviously a challenge. We hear frequently from the property owners there that they're negatively impacted. Um, you know, an interesting point of history, uh, 42nd Street between 7th and 8th Avenue um, is a result of an EDC uh, joint state project to totally redevelop that area. 
Um, so that area, 42nd Street between 7th and 8th Avenue, um, is, is a development project that we undertook because the area was a mess um, in the you know, 80s and 90s. Um, and as a result of those efforts, it is what it is today, which is a very successful, albeit crowded, tourist mecca. Um, so what we want, we absolutely want to do things that we can to make sure that that area continues to be successful. It's a it's a complex joint agency effort. Uh, you know, I, I, it's primarily led um, by the mayor's office, DOT, uh, and NYPD because of the involvement of plazas and the public safety right. issues. Right. Um, but we're always happy to have a discussion about it. We certainly care about it as a central business district for the city, and. Um, the only thing that I would add is, you know, as, as, a, as a property owner there, uh, we also are, have a vested interest in it. Got it. Appreciate that. And um, I should just commend you guys on East Midtown and, and a lot of work that you guys did with my predecessor and, uh, and the may, you know, mayor's office and, yeah. and DOT. So uh, I, I, I recognize that and I appreciate that. And I know you, and folks here and outside of here had a lot to do with that. Yeah. Also, I know I think it's a model for other parts of the city to look at how do we connect transportation options to development and growth. So I always encourage you to keep looking at that. One other thing before I hand it back over is um, the waterfront, which we should do a waterfront probably hearing at some point, but the waterfront on the East River, which is slated for uh, expansion and public access, mm -hmm. something I wholeheartedly support yes. and uh, hopefully we'll have it fully funded in the future. Um, the, there are concerns from the community, both in my district and Councilmember Kalos, who's just, I think, on paternity leave now, so can't be here, about the the access to it, particularly as a, for you guys have a project on 54th Street to develop a bridge there and has caused a lot of concern amount amongst the uh, nearby residents for losing park space and 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 uh, p more pedestrian traffic, things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, a, I just wanted to give you the, the, the heads up, we're going to be sending you guys something just to sort of ask some questions about it. Yeah. Why, why have you here anyway? Can you give me any sense of if you know, um, uh, your evaluation of the different options there. 54th Street's been slated as the bridge, and if you guys looked at other options nearby, and, and also cost. $20 million was the cost of 54th Street, and whether there's the cost numbers on the other ones. Right, yeah. So, um, absolutely. So you're talking about the uh, bridge to the Greenway. Yeah. So the, um, so this, so over the, over the course of the last um, I think, you know, five to eight years, um, we looked at a series, the city looked at a series of options to the extent the Greenway was ever funded. Um, and it was, it was with the community board at that time, based on that analysis, it was agreed that this was the best option. It really is the only viable option, but we can, you know, we continue to be willing to explore other alternatives. Um, I think, you know, as it happens, the residents that are located immediately there, you know, are concerned about additional traffic into their area, but it's really important that the Greenway be uh, handicap accessible, mm -hmm. um, and this is, this is a part of that, so there needs to be uh, an accessible location. It's, we don't think it will have significant negative impact on parkland. To the contrary, it would directly connect those people right across to a huge new park being built on the waterfront, um, and it, I th if anything, it would have a minimal to nominal impact. Um, you know, I, I know some concerns have concerns, some residents have concerns about pedestrians going by their buildings and or, you know, how it will impact their view. Um, but I, um, I think bro broadly speaking, you know, we think it's important that it be handicapped accessible. Gotcha. So we're going to be, we'll send you something that just kind of outlines Please. some yeah, of the yeah. comments from the mm -hmm. community of and that way you can wholly answer some of the questions and concerns. Yeah. So uh, just so you know. So thank you. I should not I have to leave, but thank you to all the groups that, I'm sorry, I won't be able to hear you, but I have your testimony. I know a good number that are here. And thank you to Chairman Blum for your Thank you, Councilman Powers. And now Councilmember Machaca. Thank you, Chair. Uh, again, congratulations on your new post. Really excited to be on the committee, and welcome to both of you for um, your testimony. I know it's been long, so I'll try to get right to it. Um, I, I can't, but I can't continue with questions until I, I just kind of sing the praises of the work, um, uh, President Patchett uh, <laughs> and your team, uh, that that you've really done in your tenure as leader. Uh, Sunset Park and like other commu communities are really looking for that engagement on the ground and and I've seen that firsthand uh, your team is there to kind of really amplify that that leadership and so I kind of seen that firsthand yeah. as we um, and I always describe it like this but 
as we continue to break the bones of our of our entire city institutions mm -hmm. and reset them in a way that that has real impact on the ground and so just thank you thank you thank you no thank you it's been a great partnership and i'm looking forward to to more to uh, more yes. of that um but it's not just edc that has ideas about our community um folks in the state like our governor have presented things like their mta and port authority plan mm -hmm. can you give us a sense about what and how EDC is thinking about its proposal. I mean, there, there are two things that are kind of coming up strongly in their big mm -hmm. kind of engagement plan around a MTA line yeah. uh, into Red Hook and then the, the kind of moving the terminal over mm -hmm. to SBMT. You referenced SBMT as, um, and I know we're all waiting. Uh, this is, the, yeah. the timeline has been extended, and I know you're, you're kind of crunching the numbers and trying to understand that, but yeah. this is something that we've all kind of been on the ground yes. with since the beginning of my term. Of um, course, I know. The last term. Uh, so that's kind of the first big picture. Give us a sense about what's, what's happening there and, and how we can help. Sure. So, I mean, I think, um, you know, I read about um, this announcement in the press like you did, um, which is, as I understand it, the plans for a st study of a one train extension to, um, to the Brooklyn waterfront in Red Hook, um, which is interesting, um, but un very nonspecific, um, and also an a request for the Port Authority to study the relocation of the Red Hook Container Terminal to South Brooklyn Marine Terminal. Um, I think, you know, from, from, from our perspective, you know, I don't, it's a little hard to evaluate right now because it's, it's not clear what they're proposing exactly. I think right now they're, stu they're proposing to study. So, you know, we welcome, obviously, evaluating additional transit options for Red Hook, which is a transit star of community. Um, but, you know, I think the, from our perspective, the thing that we come at this with is our commitment to waterfront jobs so that are accessible to the community. So, you know, Red Hook Container Terminal provides important jobs to the community. Um, we want to make sure that whatever is done there, that we maximize the number of jobs in, that are available on the waterfront and that are accessible to people in the community. That's my perspective on it. You know, I will be interested to see what they come out with, but that's going to be our position no matter what, as we want to see those jobs, um, you know, that we ensure we have those jobs and we continue to grow them on the waterfront in Brooklyn. And it's really important for us to kind of have this conversation in this public hearing for the chair to understand this as well, that this is, this is kind of, um, uh, while it's big and in a lot of ways, a lot of open questions to this, yeah. we do have some on the ground efforts that are, that are ongoing. Mm -hmm. and, and that, I think, needs to be respected. So I just want to let you know and to the public that's listening at home that this is an important thing for us to continue to work on and that they can be invited with information. Uh, a lot of what's happening on the ground is city responsibility. Yeah. We know that Port Authority has, has some piece of this, but that we can all work together. And I'm glad that, that you're kind of hitting on the points that, that, that we care about, too, at the district level for jobs, waterfront development, economic development for, for the neighborhood. Um, the... Well, actually, what is our role there? What's that what? <laughs> what, is, what is the role of EDC in this, in this question, in this bigger, bigger question? Uh, I mean, it, right now, you know, not really any role. I mean, we, we do, as you know, own the South Brooklyn Marine Terminal. So we, whatever happens there would be a, um, EDC would have a significant role there. The, um, for the most part, the Red Hook Piers are Port Authority uh, property. So it's, we don't have a significant role to play there at the moment, but you know, I think generally speaking, the city's view would be that anything that happens, I mean, I'm not speaking for EDC specifically, but generally speaking, the city's view is that whatever happens in the city, the city certainly should have a strong say as to the future of that. Um, and that's certainly my position, and I know it's the mayor's position. Good. I agree with that. Yeah. We should definitely have, and, and by extension, the community uh, exactly, on the Exactly. Uh, absolutely. The city and by extension, the community, yes. So. Um, a, a bigger question, because I know that the, the, the public hearing, this public hearing is really kind of looking at all the different boroughs and how they really think about um, themselves on a borough level citywide. And what's interesting about Sunset Park and Red Hook is there's a lot of activity. One of those things is um, a, a kind of possible land use, uh, a ULERP from uh, an applicant called Industry City that's on its way. Um, it's probably one of the largest, I'm trying to ask analysts to think about this, whether or not we've received a six million square feet 
property Euler yeah. in, the, in the recent history uh, that has these kind of questions around manufacturing, mm -hmm. uh, industrial, maritime components, um, and then next to a community like Sunset Park. So can you tell us a little bit, as we think about the future, the next four years, and thinking about how all these engines that EDC is really dedicating time, effort, mm -hmm. restructuring with what's happening at Sunset Park. Yeah. What what does it mean when when something like Industry City is is possibly coming forward with a ULERP for for you as yeah. as as EDC? Well, I think the good thing is it it uh, it's 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 sort of frankly a, a I don't want I mean I think Industry City is an incredibly important. Uh, asset for the community and it needs to be, whatever happens there needs to be uh, done in co coordination with the community. Um, and I, I, have, I, don't, I have not seen, I don't, they, haven't, they haven't applied, they haven't certified yet, have they? No, uh, they're, they're in the middle of their environmental review, okay. so they just kind of, we just were the hearing, and right. so we're waiting for city planning to come back. So, so I think, but broadly speaking, it, in some sense it does not impact EDC in that we are absolutely committed to ensuring that all of our properties remain industrial focused properties with rents that are affordable to, you know, businesses that are employing Sunset Park residents. So, you know, if whatever happens in the, you know, as a result of change to industry city, that's our commitment. So we are, we are there planning to pursue that no matter what, as we've talked about, and we want to make sure that we enhance our workforce uh, development operations there, that we get more people, members of the community into the jobs that are at the Brooklyn Army Terminal. Um, we want to make sure that South Brooklyn Marine Terminal has a lot of good accessible jobs. We want to improve the infrastructure down there. Those are all things that we're focused on, almost regardless of what happens in Industry City. And I think, you know, we obviously are interested to know, but I don't think it changes our fundamental focus on ensuring that there are good industrial jobs that are accessible to Sunset Parkers. Well, and again, I, I think what, what's important about what you just said is, is how the work that we do at the city level with property that's managed by the city mm -hmm. um, has ha, could have positive, yeah. impactful um, connection to private applications. Mm -hmm. And so this, this is like this is a bigger question for me as a council member that has a lot of power around land use yeah. and other members of the city council that are going to get applications where EDC can actually help inform some of that work because mm -hmm. you're doing it. Yeah. And I guess that's what I want to put out there as as a question for the next four years as we think about how each of these boroughs and these engines that you're investing a lot of time and effort can play a role in advising us at the council level yeah. about how we can talk about these things and how there, you know, while there might be natural walls of communication about a private application, this is at the end of the day still a public, uh, a public move. Mm -hmm. A ULERP is a public process. Um, what the private applicant is asking for is a public okay and a key to unlock a potential that they're describing. So it'd be great if we can kind of make that a, a kind of citywide mm -hmm. goal, yeah. um, but think about it in this six million square foot of property that wants yeah. to change its use yeah. uh, right next to a place that we're spending hundreds of millions of dollars on right now. Absolutely. Uh, again, I, I want the chair to understand that as well because I want to be coming back to him for some of that leadership. And then finally, there are two things that are, I just want to point out that I think would be a good citywide effort. As a chair of the Immigration Committee, a lot of work is, is, is being done to think about how we, how we lift our immigrant um, um, uh, our immigrants with documents that are here from other countries that have high skills and diplomas and uh, have careers that they're coming here and kind of starting over and where we can work together uh, through programs that already existed in the past but have been defunded like the Immigrant Bridge Program yeah. and other things at EDC where we can kind of really show how we're working with our immigration system right now um, with people who, who with just a couple little pieces of, of um, support yeah. can, can be part of our entrepreneurial workforce. Absolutely. I mean, it's the city of immigrants, right? Yeah. And we, and we have them here and we can, we can reach out to them. And, and then finally, the, the DOC NYC RFP is, is coming up. And that's a citywide impact as yes. well. Uh -huh. And so Red Hook and Center Park are a waterfront community. And so if you can give us a little update on how we as a committee and as members who have waterfronts can, can impact that in, in, in uh, ideas and how to shape yeah. that for the next chapter. Right. Well, I, I, I guess I'm happy to have conversations about it. As, as I, I 
happen to know that you have a constituent who has interested in that, um, and I've had conversations with her about it. Um, and and I, thank you for all that. I, I, yeah, sure. I, specifically about this, and in fact, just to give you a very specific, I am waiting for her to um, uh, propose, you know, to, to clarify what her, um, her cons not uh, specifically as relates to the DOC NYC um, RFP, what, you know, what her concerns would be. Um, and so I am anxious to see, I mean, at least specifically as to that, you know, exactly what it is that she would like to, to see and we'll obviously talk to you about it and consider whatever it is that she proposes. I know she's been busy. I understand there was some incident with a rapper. I don't, I'm not, yeah. <laughs> sure. Yeah, but, but, um, but as soon as uh, she has a moment to focus on it, we'll okay. obviously take that under consideration. And just so you know where I'm gonna be coming from is thinking about nonprofits. Um, yeah. And, and how we how we open up these waterfronts as a way for education and connection to, to ease that and and really kind of build an opportunity there that that will allow for more more historic ships more education opportunities mm -hmm. uh, for for the public absolutely right. okay thank, thank you thank you, you. Thank you council member okay Bouchard. congrats thanks uh, clearly we are in good hands president Patrick with you and your team and we look forward to uh, this type of dialogue I yep. think we we have a crash course degree in yeah. EDC today we graduated all with a uh, degree today right. uh, but just this is really the tip of the iceberg and yeah. you can see between Alex and I we have so many topics that we could have covered uh, and each one of them really de demand their own hearing good. and I think this is how we'll flush out and grow and hear the council members concern so I thank you for spending over two hours with us today inviting us to the board meeting this morning and we look forward to working with you and your my team. pleasure thank you so much thank you thank you and okay. now our panel that's been we thank you and I see you have testimony so feel free to, to summarize if you like uh, we have Lena Afridi from South Broad Street we have Rose Uzenkowski and that's transportation alternatives riley Edward, edwards from citizen budget commission and john falcone from jobs first nyc so we have four if you like to come on up if you're i think we have most of your testimony submitted thank you again to the edc team that stayed for over two hours you get a big thumbs up uh, thank you i had four yes let me try that again. Well, they may not have all stayed, but I had John Falcone, Lena Afridi, Rose Yuzinkowski, and Riley Edwards. <coughs> Whoever would like to go first, you have to just turn the mics on, identify, and then... I'll just, I'll just get started. Perfect. Um, Jump right. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you, Chairman Vallone and the members of the Committee on, the <coughs> Economic, De on Economic Development for the opportunity to testify. My name is Lena Afridi. I'm the Policy Coordinator for Equitable Economic Development at ANHD. That's the Association for Neighborhood and Housing Development. We're a membership organization of New York City neighborhood-based neighborhood nonprofit community organizations all over the five boroughs. Our mission is to ensure flourishing neighborhoods and decent affordable housing for all New Yorkers. We have uh, over 100 members throughout the five boroughs. Um, ANHD applauds EDC's commitment to job creation, in particular its partnership with us and the City Foundation in creating the Industrial Developer Fund and in support of the Un Urban Manufacturing Accelerator Fund, which are tools that help nonprofit industrial developers create and maintain properties to be used for industrial manufacturing business and jobs. We also recognize the steps EDC has taken to date to increase transparency in its development processes. However, we believe much more can be done. We encourage EDC to implement the following measures in order to create a more open, transparent, and equitable development process. Um, first of all, we'd like EDC to add community stakeholder representation on its board. Um, none of EDC's 27 member, uh, board of director members are explicitly tasked as community representatives. Uh, we also want to ensure that we protect the public interest in our public land. Public land is an extremely valuable and limited resource. EDC is tasked with developing many of these parcels. We call on EDC to work closely with community stakeholders and local elected officials to ensure that the projects built on these sites are to the benefit and of and meet the needs of current neighborhood residents. Um, EDC should no longer be disposing of city-owned land to private companies. Um, and lastly, we want to ensure that job creation and economic development programs meet current population employment levels and needs. EDC spends substantial funds and resources toward job creation and employment programs. However, it's not clear on a project level or agency-wide 
what share of these economic development opportunities meet and align with the employment needs um, of the city's current population. EDC needs to report not only on a project's projected job creation numbers, but on the number of jobs at each income level, potential wages earned, and whether these jobs are full-time or part-time. Um, most importantly, EDC needs to ensure that these local jobs go to local people by strengthening its higher NYC initiative. Um, lastly, I'll just say really quickly, we also would like to see more transparency on the MWBE side. Um, what share of MWBE contracts go to local New York City-based businesses rather than businesses outside of the city? Um, what share go to small businesses and what share go to, go to immigrant-owned businesses? Um, we're looking forward to working with EDC and Council uh, in our goal toward a more equitable city. Thank you. Thank you, Lena, for speed reading yeah, that entire testimony. <laughs> yeah, than, that was a record right there. Uh, but also, that's why I went to the board meeting this morning. You know, I think just being aware, us being present, I welcome you guys to come to us to the next quarterly meeting. I agree. You know, the first steps is really seeing the policy done at the board, who's on the board, who's appointed to the board, when their terms are up. All of that is very, very important. So I agree. So whoever's next. Go ahead, go for it. Hello, and thank you for having me here today. My name's Rose. I'm from Transportation Alternatives. Good afternoon, Rose. Good afternoon. Um, just as a quick point of clarification before I begin, I had believed that I would be testifying primarily um, before the Economic Development Corporation. Um, so if you see any you here um, that would, uh, you know, refer to the EDC, um, I apologize for any, you know, slight confusion there. Um, but otherwise, I will begin. Um, thank you for having me today and for the opportunity to speak with you today about a subject that is near and dear to me, local waterfront access and the connectivity of recreation and alternative transportation networks across our city shorelines. I come before you as a member of the Harboring Committee of Transportation Alternatives. The Harboring Committee was formed in 2011 with the express interest of creating a 50-mile continuous and contiguous bike and pedestrian greenway around New York Harbor connecting the shores of New Jersey, Staten Island, Manhattan, and Brooklyn. As a member of the Harboring Committee, I fight for this vision because I believe in the unlocked potential of our city's waterfront spaces and the economic, transportation, and recreational opportunities that smart investment in these waterfront spaces can and will create as long as that investment includes expanded waterfront access across our beautiful shorelines. The increasing interest in Brooklyn's shoreline and the similar economic boom that's occurring across Staten Island's long decrepit North Shore waterfront and, nor and Northern New Jersey's Hudson River shoreline all offer testimony to the inherent value that the beautiful waterfront spaces in and around New York City hold. Likewise, the continuing economic revitalization happening across Manhattan's far west side and its concurrence with installation of the popular, popular Hudson River Greenway Trail demonstrates that economic, economic expansion and recreational access don't have to be in competition along our waterfront. Our shorelines can act as both an economic driver and as a place where people run, walk, bike, play, commute, and take advantage of our waters. In order to use our waterfront spaces most effectively, bike and pedestrian spaces don't just need to be accessible for all, but fully connected and fully protected. This means bringing bike and pedestrian access to the missing link to a connected New York Harbor the Verrazano Bridge, and it also means gaining an, an official greenway designation for the entire length of this path. The bridge can draw, the Verrazano Bridge can draw tourists into the furthest reaches of Staten Island and Brooklyn, just as the Brooklyn Bridge bike path has allowed millions to discover downtown Brooklyn. Similarly, such a path has a potential to further link the regional economies of both Staten Island's North Shore and downtown Brooklyn, just as the paths on the East River bridges have linked the economies of downtown Manhattan and downtown Brooklyn. Lastly, and most obviously, such a pathway could expand 
commuting options for Brooklyn and Staten Island residents while offering runners and cyclists on both sides of the Narrows a wonderful space to further appreciate our beautiful city. In the meantime, completing bike and pedestrian access to all the bridges surrounding the harbor without adding safe spaces for pedestrians and cyclists to go once they get on land would only, would only take away from the value of those bridge paths. Right now, Staten Island's North Shore waterfront is the most practical place to demand expansion of the Greenway in order to address this issue. Work on the Gothels and the Bayonne Bridges is bringing us closer to restoring bicycle access to both. This creates a demand for spaces to walk or ride upon leaving those bridge paths. At the same time, development on the Wheel, Empire Outlets, Irby, and Lighthouse Points, among other projects on our waterfront, is increasing a demand for local waterfront access. A Staten Island North Shore Greenway would provide a solution to both, while also filling in another, plate, another piece of the Harbor Ring Trail. It's likewise that we ask the New York City Economic Development Corporation as well as the Committee on Economic Development to join us in the fight to achieve a greenway designation along Staten Island's North Shore waterfront. You've acknowledged, and you as a NYC EDC, have acknowledged the deep needs to create more waterfront access along Staten Island's North Shore and to better connect Staten Island's North Shore communities in your North Shore 2030 report. Now is the time to act on those findings and join us in the fight for more access, for more waterfront access. Thank you, and I think you bring up an important point. With the elimination of the waterfronts committee, this committee probably will inherit the responsibility of keeping an eye on our waterfronts. So we'll be working with our council members and with you to make sure that happens. And you're not alone. We have my district is a waterfront district also, and we're all looking oh, for course. ways to expand. So thank you. Thank you so much. Good afternoon. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Good afternoon. My name is Riley Edwards. I'm a research associate at the Citizens Budget Commission. CBC is a nonpartisan organization whose mission is to achieve constructive change in the finances and services of New York City and New York State government. Last month, CBC published a report reviewing New York City's economic performance during Mayor Bill de Blasio's first term in office and recommending ways in which the city's investments could be improved. The city's economy has been strong in recent years with rising median wages and high employment growth. From 2013 to 2016, private employment grew 17% in Brooklyn, 11% in Queens, 8% in Manhattan, and 7% in the Bronx and Staten Island. As of 2016, 16.2% of private employment in New York City was located in Brooklyn, up from 13.5% in 2001. The geographic diversification of employment in New York City is a continuing and positive long-term trend. Nevertheless, job growth in the city has been dominated by low-paying occupations in healthcare and hospitality, and job growth is projected to decelerate in 2018 and 2019. Meanwhile, persistent poverty and inequality are reminders that more opportunities are needed. EDC leads the city's efforts in spurring job growth. In 2016, the annual cost of the city's economic development efforts totaled $3.2 billion, with much of this overseen by EDC. With this high cost comes a responsibility to ensure that New York City's investments in its own economy are sound. Our recently released report, Managing Economic Development Programs in New York City, an Assessment of Progress, makes the following four recommendations to improve the city's economic development tools. First, establish more detailed standards for awarding discretionary tax expenditures. Second, improve transparency and reporting on EDC <coughs> projects. Third, make capital investments in, in infrastructure to support job growth in underdeveloped neighborhoods. And four, use conduit financing to support growth in the arts, health, and education sectors. First, discretionary tax expenditures. In addition to numerous as of right tax expenditures that are available to any firm that meets certain qualifications, the city also awards substantial discretionary tax benefits worth $548 million in 2016, which are customized by EDC for individual projects or firms. 22 projects were awarded benefits in fiscal years 2015 and 2016. Nine projects were located in Queens and only one in Manhattan, with the rest split between the Bronx, Brooklyn, and Staten Island. A review of these projects found wide variation in the benefits granted per job estimated to be created. Most projects received benefits less than $30,000 per job <coughs> created, but three projects received more than $100,000 per job. 
There may be justifiable reasons for, for providing such a high level of subsidy. For example, these projects may be leveraging significant private investment. EDC should better articulate the goals of these projects, develop standards for awarding benefits that incorporate these factors, and provide a transparent method for calculating benefits. Uh, on to transparency. As required by local law, EDC publishes an annual report on projects receiving discretionary tax benefits. However, this report provides insufficient data to evaluate the full package of benefits provided to recipients. In addition, there is no reporting on outcomes of other EDC programs, such as startup incubators. Two bills passed by the Council last session made improvements to EDC reporting, but there remains a need for reporting that covers the full scope of benefits flowing to all EDC projects. On capital investment, that's one of the principal ways the city supports outer borough job growth through capital investment to establish and improve employment hubs. The biggest capital projects overseen by EDC in the last four years have been spread across all five boroughs, including Cornell Tech in Manhattan, the Brooklyn Army Terminal, the Staten Island Waterfront, Hunters Point South in Queens, and the South Bronx Greenway. Capital investment should be directed at establishing infrastructure to encourage job creation at the neighborhood level like these examples and should not be made for the benefit of individual firms. On conduit financing, that's another tool used by EDC to support economic development. Conduit debt is issued by the city, but is the obligation of a business or nonprofit. Two entities that issue conduit debt, the Build NYC Resource Corporation and the New York City Industrial Development Agency, are administered by EDC. Conduit debt has relatively low risk and low cost to the city and provides a lower cost source of capital to recipients because the debt is tax exempt. CBC supports use of conduit debt to assist the cultural, educational, and health sectors in lieu of direct city capital investment. Since 2016, 87% of conduit debt issued by these entities has been for these three sectors. Nearly half of the recipients since 2016 have been located in Manhattan, with an additional 30% located in Brooklyn. Conduit financing should be the city's main form of support for these sectors, rather than direct capital investment. One final point is that because of EDC's demonstrated success in managing its capital projects and its more flexible procurement process, EDC has broadened its responsibilities to include serving as a capital project manager for other agencies' projects, many of which are not related to economic development. This trend discourages other agencies from seeking procurement reform and shifts EDC's focus away from its mission of job creation. While there has been some positive improvement in recent years with the smaller but still substantial share of EDC capital expenditures coming from other agencies, EDC continues to have a broad mandate. For example, the NYC ferry expansion and the BQX streetcar proposal are under the purview of EDC, although they are transportation projects in substance. Reforms that standardize discretionary tax benefits, increase transparency, support capital investment in neighborhoods, and continue using conduit financing to assist nonprofits while keeping EDC's focus on job creation will move the city toward, it, toward its goal of a strong economy that creates opportunities for all New Yorkers. Thank you for the opportunity to speak on this topic. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Riley. You have the distinguished recognition to be the last one for today. So I know, and not only am I <laughs> not only am I lucky to be uh, the last one, I'm also lucky to present in front of my council member, Council Member Menchaca. We have a great council member. Um, <laughs> good afternoon, Chair Vallone. Uh, congratulations on the appointment. Thank you. Uh, I am not Sherazad Langlaid. I am J.T. Falcone, and I am the Senior Associate of Workforce and Economic Development at Jobs First NYC. We are a policy to practice intermediary working to improve the workforce development system and ensure that all New Yorkers are in a position to access and climb the economic ladder of New York City's labor market. For 10 years, Jobs First NYC has been working with local communities and citywide, developing and supporting collaborative and innovative strategies to find innovative solutions, that's twice, to support out of school, out of work, young adults in New York. We're here today to lift up one such strategy, which is the Lower East Side Employment Network, the lesson, as well as to recommend that while considering the agenda for the next four years of the New York City Economic Development Corporation, workforce strategies like the lesson are integrated in service of e the EDC's mission to promote and grow quality jobs for all New Yorkers. The lesson is a coalition of eight nonprofit agencies working together in partnership with their local community board, CB3, it has served the needs of the residents of the Lower East Side while that neighborhood has seen a swell of economic development activity by ensuring that local residents are appropriately trained for and positioned to benefit from the job opportunities that result from economic development in the area. By agreeing to collaborate rather than compete, these eight nonprofits have improved their engagement of local employers and developers to the benefits of residents of the Lower East Side. With CB3 as a partner, Lesson is able to leverage this strong relationship and negotiate with incoming employers. 
Because businesses and developers have a clear access point for local talent, they know who to reach out to when they need candidates, and the nonprofits, by pooling their resources, can offer a broader range of training options and ready a larger talent pool. Thus, the network collectively fills a greater percentage of job openings, all while reducing the developer's interview to hire ratio to three to one. We call it a win, win, win. Uh, that said, these models are costly. <clears throat> they require hard to come by planning dollars to offset the cost of development. And while the city looks to invest in its physical infrastructure through the work of the NYC EDC, we recommend it considers ways to simultaneously invest in the infrastructure of its community-based organizations and workforce partners to help communities respond to and benefit from the economic activity that results in the EDC's development. Not only would this investment benefit the residents of developing communities, but it would also double down on the success of Higher NYC. By offering developers and businesses access to a trained and qualified pool of local candidates, it makes local hire an easy choice, removing any obstacles to fulfilling their quotas. By coordinating across systems, workforce development, and economic development, we can build upon ED success and ensure that over its next four years, its work continues to cultivate dynamic and resilient communities across all five boroughs. Thank you. The example of the Lesson Coalition is perfect. I'm always looking for examples that we can bring to the rest of the city. Here's a perfect way that community-based organizations and workforce partners can be expanded. Yeah. And talking about the hundreds of millions of dollars that the EDC was talking about, this is not a huge demand. So I think I agree with you on this. Yeah. Councilman Machaca and Rivera, do you have any questions for before we let them go? Thank you. Um, and again, welcome all of you. Um, what was your name again? JT Falcone. JT. Okay. You have to remember that. Can, yeah, I know. Well, you know, where do you live in Sunset Park? <laughs> or, or. Uh, intersection of 40th and 6th Ave. So right okay. between the park and. Yeah. Green. Okay, a lot of stuff happening at Sunset Park. Uh, I hope you vote every year I'm in participatory budgeting. Oh, you can believe I do. Okay, awesome. That's great. All right, so you're, you're, you're plugged in. So I have a question for you on your testimony, and I'm really happy that, that you kind of pointed out the work that EDC can do to really support the nonprofits. And tell me how, because here you're, you're kind of telling, telling us, hey, look, we've got to invest in our infrastructure. What does that mean? Uh, is there a plan? Uh, can, less, can the work that you're doing through Lesson and, and Jobs First New York City help us come up with, with an actual, uh, uh, I mean, I want to say plan, but an actual way to funnel dollars? Have you thought about it more than just investment? And I want to know a little bit more about that if you have that today. And if not, we can kind of keep working about how, how we can bring that into into the conversation. Yeah, of course. I lift up Lesson because it's a great example of a time that Jobs First has been able to work with the EDC directly. Uh, specifically, it was through the Euler process of Essex Crossing that we were able to gain some serious wins with developers. Um, so there are a number of different partnerships throughout the city that Jobs First is working on and is developing. Uh, specifically, I've worked in Staten Island on a partnership called Youth Wins. Uh, and basically, what we do as an organization is we convene the necessary stakeholders and give them a platform to talk about strategies that would work for them. So Jobs First tries not to parachute into a neighborhood and say, this is the strategy for you. We try to provide a platform for the, the players to really come together. So I keep it vague and, and reference investment more generally, because really what we need are, is we need areas for, for groups to do this, and we need players that can act as conveners outside of Jobs First. Um, I mean, we're eight people, and we work hard, but <laughs> we can't be everywhere at once. Uh, when I talk specifically about ways that we can work together with EDC and with the council, um, the ways are many. Information is such an important resource. We are able to, and we have been looking at some of the work that along the rezone in, in uh, Jerome Ave and some of the EDC's work at Bronx Point to develop a regional um, workforce partnership to serve the South Bronx area as a result of the fact that dedicated city employees from EDC and from city planning came to us, recognized our work, and said, we want to bring you in on these conversations. And I think one of the real, um, one of the real challenges that we have in the city, as my colleague mentioned, is, is transparency and communication. So opportunities to work together with the agency and with the council, um, opportunities for us to speak uh, more transparently about workforce as a concept, and then ultimately, it's about messaging. We need to talk to developers, and we need to talk to the EDC overall, and, and all of us need to come together to say that 
these, I, I, I benefit from Industry City. I love Industry City. These projects are only as good as, as they are able to give back to the neighborhoods. Um, and I think that we have some really great examples of the EDC working to do that with Essex Crossing and working to do that with Bronx Point. Um, so I'm here really just to emphasize some areas where they've been really successful and ask to spread that more evenly across the work. Awesome. I don't have any other questions, but um, I hope we can exchange information. I'd love for you to be part of the conversation in Sunset Park around Industry City and, and really bringing all these ideas to the table so that we can increase transparency, bring this model in uh, either officially or just through your experiences, but every neighborhood could benefit from that kind of engagement on the ground, no doubt. And yeah, that's what I think we're all about. Yeah. And to the advocates that are here, this, this committee is, is here for you to shape with committee hearings and questions, so feel free to reach out to us afterwards and today. And I mean, you wait for the, for the president and or the administration to testify, so we're very aware of that. So if there are questions that you'd like to see beforehand going forward over this next term, please make sure we get them ahead because we want to advocate for you also. Uh, Councilmember Rivera, do you have any questions for the panel? Yeah, I just want to add that I, I think it's also historically how hard it's been for us to get uh, some of the projects that are under EDC's umbrella to commit on paper to local hiring. Mm. And so when you have an organization like Lesson, um, they really need room to grow. And sometimes they're, they're faced with the, the same kind of economic hurdles like high rents in some of their spaces. So I think when it comes to EDC and what we can do, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, is, is one, pushing for local hiring to be memorialized and more contracts going forward, but also in some of these larger projects like Essex Crossing to actually provide a space for this workforce center so Lesson can grow. I think that's an ask we can make, and, and you should be sure to hold us to those kinds of asks. Yes, and if I may, uh, two things that, that I want to react to. Um, Essex Crossing has done a really good job. They've actually created a space for a social enterprise cafe called the Grand Low Cafe, where young adults will be trained over a three-month period for a for-profit cafe that then turns around and benefits the Grand Street Settlement, Settlement House, which has years and years of, of great services in the neighborhood. So it's a really sustainable, interesting model, and part of it has to do with the great work of that ULERP negotiation and the ability to work with developers when the iron is hot. The other thing that's really interesting about these local networks is that we have, we have more of an ability to um, memorialize and put in stone requirements to work with a local network than we have to hire people of a certain zip code. There's a difference in discrimination and there's many laws that we have to work with and be conscious of and sensitive to. But in, insofar as the lessons work, what's really valuable about that is that you can say you have to work with these community partners. And those community partners, how they source and work with their talent, that's a way that we, we are able to think and be more thoughtful and proactive with these kinds of projects. Well, I, I thank you to the panel. I thank you to my council members for staying. And I think we are on clearly the same page. Take advantage of the opportunities before. We said strike when the iron's hot. Yeah. And this is a good time to do that. So thank you to everyone. And I think with that, we are done, so at uh, 3.40, we bring to close our first EDC meeting. Thank you, everyone.